The following primary and secondary modcast is brought to you by Forge Tactical Training. Forge Tactical is focused on supporting the mission of our nation's armed citizens, law enforcement officers, and military professionals through evolved, realistic training. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfair here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. This is a very special holiday Modcast. It's exciting. It's Modcast 127, the airing of grievances. Grievances. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all that stuff that we encounter on social media, all of those that bad advice, the bad responses, the cop outs, and we're going to provide our responses to this. This is our holiday present, our Christmas present to you. You're welcome. I'm going to say that right off the bat. Um, the way I'm going to have this set up is all this is going to be released. All this is going to be released as one big chunk. But also, once it's all done, I'm going to edit it, edit it into small little segments. And those segments can be used at your discretion. So if you run into someone that says the 1911 Superior because it won two world wars, well, you know what? You now have a panel of experts that are going to provide an excellent response to that. And you can just post that and sit back and enjoy. Sip, sip on your, your eggnog and sit by the fire. and Yeah. So, yeah, we have an awesome panel. Um, let's see here. This is going to be this is going to be a good time. I'm really looking forward to this. The panel was hand selected too, specifically for their wit, their knowledge and their Christmas sweaters. And only two of us came through with the Christmas sweater, so oh well. Um, hopefully uh, Chuck Haggard's gonna be able to make it. I don't know, we'll see. But let's start with those intros. Uh, my background's in law enforcement. I've been enjoying that law enforcement thing. I, As a matter of fact, this upcoming January will mark 20 years that I started in the academy. I've been doing it since. I guess that, may, that means I'm old. Been doing this uh, primary and secondary thing since uh, December of 2014. This has been an awesome, awesome ride, and it just seems to get better. Now we we seem to be gathering some awesome people. So speaking of awesome people, let's talk to that Tim guy. Tim, tell us about yourself. Howdy, uh, Tim Chandler. Uh, I'm teaching with uh, FPF training and uh, 360 performance shooting. Uh, my background is just an ordinary Joe who. Uh, took a concealed carry class that was awful, realized that was terrible training. And uh, I it's almost 20 years ago that I did that and I realized I needed to get a hell of a lot better. And so I spent the last uh, however many years trying to do that. And we had you on for the last shotgun mod cast and that was, that was just a good time. A lot early. of good info. I, 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 I enjoyed it. I don't care what you think. I liked it. <laughs> As long as you're happy, Matt. That's all. I That's all that matters. That's all I'm, that matters. I'm a, I'm a giver. You are. And then we have Mike. We have Mike Lewis. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> Twenty years military. Uh, retired airborne infantryman. Uh, spent half my career in the 82nd Airborne Division. Had a really cool job for the last couple of years of it. Uh, small Arms Master Gunner. Even though not school trained, it's a it's a position. I was able to do some cool things, you know, develop a little bit of training, do a little bit of uh, force mod stuff. It was a good ride. Um, been retired from the Army for two years now and doing things under my own banner with Cane Break Consulting Services here in North Carolina. Good to be here. Good to have you. As a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting on one of the uh, threads we have. Um, it's basically, what are your favorite quotes from primary and secondary from the modcasts and someone included one of yours and they said then well, we need mike lewis to come back what do you know he's on tonight so that couldn't have been better i promise i won't urge anyone to off themselves tonight <laughs> no that's okay 
that might be encouraged. And then we have Jack Lewis. Oh. Jack was on with us last night. It was an accident. We didn't meet, but we just had such a good conversation. So that, just, now it's your turn. Just to ended talk. up happening. I guess it's my turn to go. Because of so my, we don't get together as much anymore. I started off in the submarine service, and that got me into diving. Uh, and I got tired of working for a non for profit, so I became a commercial diver. Uh, got into uh, commercial and naval ships, husbandry, a lot of oil and gas. I traveled around quite a bit, and I'm also a silly person from the internet. And I've done some training. And that's it. For and you know, people are going to ask, who's this bearded dude and why is he on, even though everyone on is, has a beard? Who's this big bearded <laughs> dude? This dude with a big beard. He's funny, he's smart. Uh, yeah. yeah, he has good social media. Fit specifically for today. I don't think we could find better. Don't we have that Chuck Pressburg guy who already fell asleep? <laughs> He's muted. Unless he lost his signal. Nope, I'm here. What? You can't. Hey, there me. you are. Can you see me now? Good. Yeah. Uh, Chuck. 26-year Army veteran, recently retired firearms instructor, fucking... One of the next guy. Part-time play popo, fucking consultant for the industry and stars. So that's, that's what I got going on. I think you have a different mic on right now because you sound different. Because normally what? you're clear and it sounds like you might be working off a different microphone. No, it's, it's whatever mic's on my Bose headset. Oh, okay. I don't have an external mic uh, in Washington. It's still hooked up the office back at uh, the MSS. Gotcha. Then we have we have a, a favorite. He goes by Boarbrush. His name's Chad. And people ask for him to be on the Modcast all the time because he has good rants. <coughs> oh, you're welcome. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Chad, and I'm a little under the weather, and I took a whole lot of Sudafed I probably shouldn't have taken a little while ago, and I, yeah, I'm probably not even going to get into the beer right now. Um, yeah, my allergies went crazy today. I li my neighbors are, are actually a big industrial turkey farm down the way, and, uh, they're cleaning out the houses, and, uh. Yeah, my allergies just went nuts today. So if I'm a little out of it tonight, or if my jokes don't make sense, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's going to be really funny to me, but glad to be here. I think that covered everything. I, I think it's going to be even more funny in your current condition. Okay. Especially for us. Yeah. So... The way I thought I'd do this is I'm going. What I'm going to do is I have an entire list of all these things that we've we've run into. And what I did also is I asked uh, our network supporters, our network support people, what are some of the things that you're running into? What are some of the concepts, misconceptions, cop outs? List them. And so I got all these, this whole list. I doubt that I doubt that we're going to be able to go through the entire thing, but this will be a good start. And there are far more than just this. These, this was basically just the highlight reel. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'm just going to present a concept. And you guys, I, I'm, I'm seeing this kind of like a, a piranha frenzy. <laughs> you guys just go after it. And I'm going to sit back and laugh. And you guys are going to one-up each other. And it's going to be hilarious. So I'm, th I'm thinking the first one is what I already mentioned. And for me, a lot of the, com a lot of the comebacks for this, for these are and that's your point so the first one is the 1911 has won two two world wars and that's in defense of the 1911 being a superior weapon what would your guys's response to that be i love the 1911 i have a completely irrational love of it because i grew up reading american handgunner and what looking at those center pole pornography photos they have in there of all the tricked out custom 1911s and uh, I absolutely understand where they're coming from. It's complete crap. Uh, pistols don't win wars. Chuck can tell you about that in more detail. But the 1911 that 
was in those wars was made to a very specific standard, firing very specific ammunition. It had the ergonomics of a cheese grater. It wasn't terribly accurate. It was ridiculously expensive to produce, but it was better than everything else at the time, which was freaking Lugers and that kind of stuff. Hey, don't you knock the nam Nambu. Exactly, exactly. I, I, I love the 1911, if, and if you actually were still building that gun and shooting that ammo through it, it would still work. I mean, I think the original test, they went, what, a thousand rounds uh, without cleaning it. They would just lube it every now and then, and it went without uh, malfunction. It was a really good gun. In its day, it was the most durable, reliable service sidearm that the world had ever seen. Its day was a long time ago. And as those guns aged and as, as everybody started doing the 1911 their way instead of sticking to basically what was at the time, the TDP, it's not the same gun. The Kimber you buy on the shelf today did not win World War II, for God's sake. The Kimber you buy on the shelf today is prettier, it has better ergonomics, and it don't work worth a damn. You're much better off with something else unless you are a dedicated, hardcore 1911 nerd that knows the gun inside and out, you know, and you believe in the pathetic ancient religion of the 1911, like guys like me do. And if that's the case, there's no convincing you anyway, you're going to do what you're going to do, but it's not the gun that beginners need. It's got a really nice trigger, but that's about all it's really got going for it. Fight me. Good, good stuff. <laughs> okay. Who has something to add on to that? We, we actually yeah. dropped the 1911 on Hiroshima. <laughs> No, that was a Glock. Just didn't hit. <laughs> that was a Glock. <laughs> so that's what. No, that was a Sig 320 that blew up for Rush. They dropped. <laughs> it was a prototype. Yeah. Right. In 10 millimeter. <laughs> Chuck, you guys had some experience with uh, the 1911s in your day. Uh, I'm guessing you guys didn't find it to be quite the uh, uh, lightsaber everybody thinks it was. I have actually never uh, been issued. That's not true. First trip to Iraq, 2005, I brought a Springfield operator, two-tone green and black, but I got it from Jose from some other entity that was not the United States Army. Um, so yes, I have one combat point with 1911 under my belt. Um, I, I love them. I, I really do. Uh, where I lost the love affair with them was when I was forced to shoot other other things. And uh, I just fell in love with the, the magazine capacity. You just can't. It, it's, it's like if you end up dating a chick that uh, will um, take it in the butt, like once you've actually been with her and then go to somebody else, you, you're kind of fucking spoiled. And like every time I hold a single stack with its eight or nine or ten paltry bullets, I'm just like, eh, you, you don't take it in the butt. You know, like, uh, there's not enough bullets in this motherfucker. I don't care who you are. You show me uh, the last world champion, eight-time national fucking poobah, and uh, give me his fastest fucking splits ever on a magazine change, and they're not going to be as good as me pulling the trigger again. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't have, I'm willing to accept the maintenance and not me because I don't clean guns. I'm willing to accept that if one maintains and stays on top of a part schedule, that the 1911 is not the will malfunction, will get you killed in the streets, that the other side of the, the, uh, community has about it. If you want to clean and maintain a gun and you want to be a, a gun enthusiast and you want to tinker with your shit, it's like owning a Land Rover, man. Hey, if that's your fucking thing, you, you, you do you, boo-boo. But that Land Rover better be able to go more than 15 miles and take gas, goddammit. And that, so that's where me and the 1911 people uh, have got a part company. Now, if you want to start talking double-stack bullet hoses, then, then maybe, maybe in a non-field environment, in a uh, domestic LE slot something, uh, uh, counter terrorism, hostage, whatever. Uh, a 2011 frame with all the bullets in it uh, could could be a, a viable gun if you're willing to take care of your shit. 
but that's such a small percentage of like pretty much nobody that's arguing with me about 1911s on the internet is that guy. There are all these other guys out here. So what, what are you gonna do with that? I got nothing. Yeah, it's Tom Givens uh, is an old school. You know, he was one of the uh, gun sight uh, instructors. He carried a 1911 for a long time, and uh, I talked with him about this. And uh, he said, basically, you can you can expect that it'll take four or five rounds from a pistol for somebody to get the point. And under that metric, a 1911 is a two bad guy gun at most. And we live in a three bad guy world, right? So the, the lack of capacity is there. And the other one is people want a 1911, but they want to do it on the cheap. You cannot have an all steel gun that works worth a damn if it's not manufactured carefully. Because the 1911 was designed back when skilled craftsmanship was how you did everything, right? All the guns back then were built to this ridiculously lavish standard. You can't do that these days with even with CNC machines. It takes a lot of know-how and excellent quality control to produce a 1911 you can actually rely on. And you can't get that from a $400 thing made in the Philippines out of cast, you know, recast aluminum cans or whatever the hell they're making them out of. You have to be willing to spend the money and you have to be willing to stay on top of it. And generally when I find people who want 1911s, they want all the, the, the benefits and none of the drawbacks. And that just, that's not how it works. You've got to be, you can't be cheap and do the 1911 properly. Good stuff. Any, anything further? No, part, parts, parts quality uh, and, and all that stuff, it, it matters. Uh, metal injected molding, uh, you know, I mean, it killed Kimber. It killed Kimber. In 1994, if you talk to dudes that built custom 1911s for fucking grandmasters, they told you, do not step up to me unless you have a Springer, uh, Springer um, base gun, a Caspian frame, or a Kimber. And, and now we're like, ah, Kimber, that's like one step above Taurus. But in 1994, before they drove that fucking company in the ground, that was some economical, high-quality shit. And now it's just shit. So um, that names, cha- names and reputations change over time. So it's been two decades. My mother's like, I remember when my Kimber was the shit. Yeah, two fucking decades ago. I remember I could run two miles and 11 fucking flat. Fucking two <laughs> decades ago. So fucking get over it. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, let's go for the next one. Hey, man. Yeah? 45 because they don't make a 46, dude. <laughs> That's another good one. No. And, and, and again, I'm telling you, I have 21 rounds with this little guy. It's awesome. Just got it today. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have this cough. <laughs> I also bought a bulldog today, too, but that's another story. Um, okay, next one. Having any gun is better than no gun. Oh. Tim, are you taking it? Well, yes. Having any having rule one of a gunfight is have a gun. But uh, you're probably not in really good shape if there are two dudes in your house trying to kill you if you've got an NAA mini revolver. Right? You know, we, we have the ability to kind of prepare. Like, I don't know. I kind of plan ahead. Dude, the NAA revolver? You're, you're, you're high class, man. I'm rocking a Bond Arms Derringer. <laughs> you got to be sophisticated about it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would rather have a sharp stick than just my fingernails and harsh language, but I'm not forced to make that decision. I can buy a reasonable weapon, I can have it reasonably available, and I can use it effectively. So why in God's name would I get the least effective, lowest capacity, most marginal piece of crap I can get when I can get something that will work well? Because, I mean, it's only my life that's on the line. You know, if, if you lose... There, there, there's no participation trophy. You, you die or you're permanently maimed. I'm not into that. I want something that's going to work and that's going to give me the kind of performance I need because pistols are compromised weapons anyway. Have something that's enough. If all you can carry is the smallest, tiniest piece of thing you can find, that's different. That's strictly what you're stuck with. Yeah, some gun is better than no gun, but that's not the choice most people make. Most people end up making the choice. This is the least amount of bother for me to actually bother trying to carry. 
and I would rather not invest the time and effort in learning how to set up my equipment, my clothing, and everything around carrying a reasonable implement of defense. Because I guarantee you, if I took anyone and I set them in a room and I said, 30 seconds from now, three dudes are coming in here with big ass knives and they're going to kill you. They're going to cut your head off and put it on the internet. And I open a drawer and there's a Ruger LCP on one hand, or there's a Glock 17 with a you know, mag extension. Other nobody's reaching for that Ruger. Nobody. Unless Except it's a bucket list type thing. You carry the equipment to it. I know. Unless it's a bucket list thing. Right. Yeah, I know. I know a few people that are like, ah, I don't have one of those yet. <laughs> yeah. If you're looking for that Oconus blunderbuss kill, yeah, that's a whole different co- category. <laughs> or soap on a rope. <laughs> you know, whatever. Exactly. Get your bingo card filled up. <laughs> I'll shut up now. I can no, no, no. <laughs> any, any further stuff with any gun is better than no gun. One thing that we did discuss last night, and this was just a brief little thing about uh, when we were talking about armor, if your life is going to be dependent on something, you're going to need professional grade equipment that's professional grade pricing. Otherwise, it's just dress up. Because there's no yeah. such thing as a non professional grade bad guy. Well, I've seen some non-professional grades. I've seen a lot of them, actually. No, my, my dad, you know, it's funny that the parents end up being right. But my dad used to have this saying about how you don't skimp on brain surgeons and body armor. Yep. Those are the two things you don't fucking skip on. And now, you know, we've got this entire culture of bump my AR-500. And so it's all right. But, but your AR-500. Uh, I remember the first time I went into fucking gunfight with steel on my chest. It was fist full of dollars, and the dude that was shooting at me was actually an Italian playing a Mexican. But that doesn't it's not really germane to the current gunfight that we're dealing with here. <laughs> and you know, some gun is better than no gun, but if your gun doesn't work, and your plan is that your gun will work, uh, you, you may have gotten yourself into a situation you may not otherwise if you know your equipment. You know, is anybody going to go skydiving if they suspect their equipment? No. Uh, are you going to, people tend to think, I can go here because I have my gun. Well, A, I wouldn't go there. Uh, but B, are you sure your gun's going to work? Really? I mean, it's a bad thing to have as this is my default defense plan. If it gets really bad, I can always just. And it's always the people who say this kind of stuff who have no hand-to-hand skills, poor conditioning, I'll just shoot them, right? Well, if you've prepared with your gun as well as you've prepared with everything else, you you're, you would better just hope everything works out splendidly in your favor because otherwise you're in deep, deep trouble. When, you're, when you consider it as a defensive plan, um, you know, the acronym draw D, right? Defend, reinforce, attack, withdraw, delay, right? Well, then alongside of that, you also have your defensive positions, primary, secondary, and supplementary, right? Um, People that say that kind of stuff, they just go through life with the supplementary position. Like, they don't have their primary fighting position mentally prepared. It's like, well, when in doubt, I'll just whip that out. Like, okay, it's like, you're going out to party, but you're not taking rubbers. Like you're just going to go find some cellophane, whatever you can find. They're not actually preparing for the fight of their life. They're not getting ready for the dance. Stress they're up. not. Yeah. They're, they're just kind of bumble fucking through life because the gun is their plan, right? Self-defense well, plan, have gun problem solved. That isn't how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, but I don't think I don't think Chuck Haggard could have come in at a better time. Oh no, no, he just are you still there, Chuck? I see him. Yes. Good. All these bald white guys get confusing after a while. <laughs> bald, but I still have some. <laughs> we got the bookends over here. I'll take my hat off. How about that? Does that help? So let's see here. Oh, any uh rebuttal to that? I think I think that's that was pretty solid. I like it. 
The concept of well, it works for me. Oh god! <laughs> Somebody else kick off. I've, I've yacked enough. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> I I just I think it kind of piggybacks on the last thing. You know, it's everybody's always trying to be thrifty, trying to a good deal in the any gun you know the gun that you have is the best gun to it's good enough you know and it's like is it though i mean that's where you decided to get good enough at you know especially when people start supporting equipment you know and i've seen that too i've seen that guys with their gear do that like it's they don't want to spend the money that's where they decided to get cheap right it's maybe the root cause of a lot of that $50 a week Starbucks habit and they can't afford ammo or a better holster or some other stuff. It's like, dude, make some choices in life, right? Defense equipment's not where you cheap out. The, the works for me thing, like a lot of this stuff that you're going to talk about tonight, there's a grain of truth for it, right? There are things that a Chuck Pressburg can work with that I may not because he has a basis of experience or Claude. That's, very, that's very different than what I've got. So, Someone in his position can say it works for me because here's the crucial bit for the internet folks. He's done the work. If you have gone to great lengths to prove your equipment or prove your idea or prove it, you put it under stress, you've stress tested it, you put it on timers, you have done your best to objectively measure it to a reasonable standard, it's possible for you to go, yeah, that technique works for me, that piece of equipment works for me. The problem I see is that almost invariably, I see that said, it's by somebody who is a non-training son of a gun who has never pressure tested what he's actually yakking about. If you haven't pressure tested it, it doesn't work. I, you guys, some of you teach classes. I know Chuck teaches classes, some of the rest of you. How many times have you been in a training class and heard these words, and you know what's about to come out of my mouth? That's never happened before. And the reason it hasn't happened before is because you have not pressure tested it before. This is the first time you're actually doing what is closer to the reality that with that equipment, with that technique, that whatever, and you you see them standing there staring in slack-jawed wonder at the fact that this thing just happened. That is the invariable result of it works for me, right? You don't know if it works if you haven't proven it. You wouldn't go to a brain surgeon who just says, well, this technique works for me. No, you want to know he's using things that are in common use by other surgeons because you don't want somebody freelancing on your skull. It's the same basic concept. If you're not proving it, it ain't true. That's great. It works for me until it doesn't. Yeah. Right. And I love the fact also that you qualified it with that these are people that are not, they're not actually... They're not, they're not testing it. Yeah. Well, they don't know what they don't know. No. Right. And, like, most people have, like, no spatial awareness. So they don't even look cool doing it how they do it. They think <laughs> they look cool, but they don't. They get, like, weird palsy arms. They stand stupid. Like, they, they don't even know um, how poorly they perform because their mental image is so far removed from reality. Um, so they don't know. They don't know better, right? right. But then they put it near a of uh, bravado or of pride or whatever um, to kind of insulate themselves. So yeah, it works for me. I'm like, all right, let's see how well it works for you and uh, do it to somebody else's terms, to somebody else's standards. Right. Um, and, it, and it quickly falls apart. It's a, it's actually that people that say that and when they say it, when they're actually doing it in front of other people, they're actually walking out, like actually putting into action uh, confirmation bias. Like, Hasn't killed me yet. Like, I'm going to keep, like, playing out in traffic. I'm going to keep doing all this stuff that's wrong. It's going to get me hurt someday or somebody else hurt someday. Well, works for me. Hasn't killed me yet. Um, it, it's confirmation bias. It, well, as long as I have not suffered immediate ramifications of my actions, it can't be bad. Right. That's what it boils down There's a, there's a significant stuff. overlap in the Venn diagram between the it works for me crowd and the there's no timer in a gunfight crowd. Because it both basically comes down to the same thing. Placing something to an objective measure or an objective standard is anathema. It's unthinkable because if I 
put myself to this objective measure and I look at this, I have to confront the possibility that I suck. And then I have to do the hard work of not sucking. And that's inconvenient and it's time consuming and it doesn't make me feel happy and fuzzy right now. And the it processor tends- speed yeah. suffers at that point because they're worried about everything but doing it. Yep. You know, you said there's no timer in a gunfight. Yeah, there is. Instead of a par time and a buzzer, it's a round in your chest cavity. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) That buzzer's awful loud. Might be the last thing you ever hear. So, Chuck, are you with us? Haggard? I am. Okay. (laughs) The way you were just looking at the camera, it was just like... What's going on here? What am I doing here? Well, uh, on my end, the video is uh, doing this spastic jump back and forth thing all over the place. And oh. um, I've been in and out. I don't know what's going on. It looks pretty funky. You, you look you look fine and you sound great. Okay. And your mustache is fantastic. <laughs> well, at least I got that going on. It's all that matters. His head's um, so symmetrical. It is. <laughs> uh, nice next one go, go ahead I was about to say that my in my previous employment I was constantly fighting uniform and uh, grooming standards and the nice thing about my new job is is I'm fully in compliance with that with uh, with this going on so that's kind of cool yeah <laughs> um, next one is to each his own but it's fairly close to that last one right <clears throat> Anything specific with to each his own you guys would counter? Uh, normally, that's a dismissive. Uh, yeah. You, you're talking to somebody and you point out, uh, I don't know, why their surface sucks. And, well, it works for me to each his own. That's kind of a dismissive. I'm done listening to anything else you have to say. And the it works for me thing, to, to kind of piggyback both those ideas, is – something I, I see a lot typically online uh, where people are willfully, you know, okay, it has worked for you so far, but you are willfully disregarding mountains of evidence that there is a problem with your technique, with your gear, uh, whatever. Uh, sometimes it can be really entrenched. Some years ago I had to deal with uh, my department went and got Glock 22s in 2006, and none of them worked. Uh, I had people who were carrying Glock 22s telling me, well, you know, my gun always works and blah, 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 blah. I I don't know where I got the the terminology from, but some people are prone to malfunction amnesia. Uh, What what was mentioned before about that's never happened to me before – uh, when I was teaching with Stratagos and we were doing the low light instructor school, there was only a half day of live fire. Everything else was force on force or uh, um, dry practice. So we were doing the live fire and without fail, every single range, low light range event that I did without fail had at least one clock 22 that didn't run. Well, it's never happened before. And I'd find out things like they'd never fired it with duty ammo. They'd never fired it with the light mounted because they didn't want to gum up the lens on their light. They'd never fired it one handed uh, using a flashlight, etc. So they had never pressure tested. And I mean, minimally pressure tested, just go to the range and do something realistic besides shooting a qual. never pressure tested their gear. Uh, that, that kind of thing is, is, was epidemic. I got into a debate with a federal agent one time. Oh, there's no problem. My agency's got 10,000 on the street, yada, yada, yada. Okay, now let's say all of them work perfectly. Between my agency and Indiana State Police that same year, we had over 1,000 guns that didn't work. I would argue a 10% failure rate in a weapon system is pretty damn significant. Uh, but no, I've made an emotional investment in this. I've made an emotional investment in my SERPA, in my point shooting debate, or whatever the case is. And uh, to each his own is I'm done listening because 
you know, it's kind of the verbal tick of I'm going to put my fingers in my ears and say, la, 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 la. Amen. I, uh, it's, it's their way of ending the thread, ending the conversation, you know, off, off all that ego. And the it works for me and to each his own. I have, I have three good friends that rock uh, XDs in 40 cal and they don't run one with one in the chamber. I, I've i talked to them. I don't, you know, there's a point where I'm informing them against their will and I don't know what to say. And and they get to, they treat me, it's like the locker room scene with Iceman and Maverick and they're like, well, you, you got one in the chamber and you don't have an external safety on your Glock. Like you're dangerous, man. You know, every time you go out, you're dangerous. And, and it, I almost have to reverse it back. I'm like, well, to each his own, bro. Like, I, I, I can show you all the evidence on the earth through the internet and other places, but you know, they, they just they, they've they've taken their motherfucker and removed it from receive, and that's it. You know, and uh, then you can do. It, you know, it's just because I'm just like I'm not training anybody. You know, I'm not in a senpai kopai relationship. You know, there's there's nothing where they kind of have to listen to me you know it's if, if i'm just dealing with people that i know or acquaintances like there's a point to me where it's like it's just not worth it i'm like there's no point in me talking to this person anymore have you, you know, considered we're, we're maybe down. playing some have you considered playing some sand volleyball with them first <laughs> no nah, man they probably suck at that too okay that's why you used to baby. <laughs> just doing the <laughs> top gun thing I think there's well, there's a there's a third idiom that's not been mentioned yet, but it's uh, agree to disagree. Yeah, it's right in that sequence, yeah. and that one just fucking drives me up the wall. And like, like my wife said it to me last night, and I was just like, <laughs> "No, no, I do not agree to disagree." <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Here I am, just telegraphing my weakness for the world of Islam. Chad, we'll we'll agree to disagree here. God. So uh, I, I will not agree to that. So uh, agree to disagree uh, to me is like only about things that don't affect me. So when it comes to like being a fucking liberal, your vote actually does affect me. So we can't just agree to disagree because your shit is affecting me. You won't even carry a fucking single action army and a goddamn troop up as long as you're my, not my teammate doesn't affect me. You do you, boo boo. But if you're on my team and you're carrying some derp tastic fucking bullshit, now we can't agree to disagree because your shit will get me killed on the streets. So that's where the line is about like I can't talk to this guy anymore. All right, well if you're not living, you know, your life. Uh, or, or, you know, owing your life to this individual, trusting, relying your life on this individual, let him go be a faggot. Bye. Go be a faggot. Uh, if, if you are going to have to fucking ride in a cruiser with this guy and he's decided that uh, bullets to the fucking rear facing up in his magazine pouches is the fucking shit, man. That's the way to go. Um, it's time for you to have a fucking talk with that man. Like, Hey, let's pull over to park a lot and work some shit out. Kind of, kind of talk. Um, otherwise, just let them, just let them go, man. Bye, bye. Yeah, I think that there's a the difference in there. What Chuck was just saying is that it, any of these uh, idioms can be used and not get, ruffle any feathers and not even make you look dumb if you're in the right context, the right group of people. Within that circle of trust, because then you can say, "Hey, man, you be you," because I know that like we're both professionals. Like, I, I, there's things that I'll say to to peers, to counterparts, and to mentors that I would never say to somebody I don't really know, or that I know sucks. Like, I wouldn't give them that out, that easy out, or that professional leeway. Uh, does that make sense? Like, absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. I am thinking through a haze here. No, no, no. That's you're right on. Next one, this is I'm a just trying to be intellectually one. like honest with it because I know there are times that I've said it and hearing Chucks just say that, I'm like, yeah, that's true because I have said some of those things. Not agree to disagree, yeah. but the other two. Damn it, Chad. <laughs> God. This is a special one. It goes out to 
this is a, this is a request going out to Chuck Haggard. I don't use lights because they are a target indicator. That's true if you're Come on, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's a target indicator if you're stupid. If your tactics suck, I mean you, you your body, you your existence is a target indicator. If you do stupid shit, you're a target indicator. If you stomp through the leaves, if you don't have any noise discipline, you don't have any light discipline, you don't know how to work cover and concealment, everything's a target. So can a lighter? Yes. Use them properly. It's not a headlight on a car. You're not driving down the road. If you're scared of the boogeyman, you probably shouldn't go out after dark. Um, so improper use of anything, cover, camouflage, noise, you know, whatever. Yeah, it could be a target indicator. But yet, if you're stupid, that's true. Follow up to that. Yeah, uh, the whole light will be, now I'm speaking from the context of what I think is, is where most of these conversations happen, civilian self-defense. <clears throat> if you're in a military unit and, you know, bad light discipline can get your whole team lit up by a bunch of smelly dudes with RPGs, okay. Uh, but even those guys still use white lights, but they have other methods that they use. But for us, the primary concern I have with dudes in my house is not that I will give my location away. It's that if I need to shoot this dude, I need to positively identify that this is a person who needs to be shot. I need to positively identify that the uh, he's not a relative. You know, well, nobody comes in my house. How many times Claude Werner has collected this large litany of people who have shot their family members because they shot at a shape in the dark when it made noise and it turned out to be their daughter or their daughter's boyfriend or something else like that, right? And, you know, on the other end of shooting somebody you didn't intend to shoot kind of stinks. On a, by the same token, if you can, prosecutors won't take what Gabe Suarez said on his blog as a, a way around the laws that they are enforcing. You have to identify that what you, the person you're about to drop the hammer on needs to be shot. And you can't do that with ESP. You have to clearly identify what it is you're about to do. And I know in the law enforcement world, it's the same thing. You can't just shoot at shapes in the dark. You have to positively identify a reasonable threat before you can pull the trigger, or you're just setting yourself up for all kinds of damage. I'm not worried about my light making me a target indicator because I'm not crawling up on somebody's compound in Kandahar. I'm worried about making sure that if I have to shoot somebody, I have clearly identified who it is, that they have the capacity to kill me and that it is a necessary action so that when I'm investigated later, they go, well, you know, what made you believe you had to shoot him? Because, you know, homeboy had a Lorsen 380 in his hand. I had to shoot him. He's in my house at 3 a.m. I identified he had a weapon. He ain't there to tell me about Jesus. You're good to go, right? He, he, he might he, be. He, he he's in the neighborhood. Tell me about Jesus or sell me insurance or, or sell me Girl, Girl Scout cookies. He's up to no good. I do what I have to do, but I can critically say I saw his weapon in the dark because my gun has. Apparently, his gun's got a time warp. Wow, that's that's impressive. Is this guy not ready? See that shit? <laughs> oh, you you froze for a second there, Tim. I do that. I was probably just laughing. So go ahead. Okay. Are you are you saying the warning shot that I fire with my shotgun isn't going to give me enough light to do a, a target identification? If you're using Remington Golden Saber ammo, maybe. Maybe. But, uh, I, I don't advise the Joe Biden method of, oh, I saw it in the flash, bam. Yeah, yeah. The, the Joe Biden isn't something I would actually use. <laughs> it's after I've done, what was it, rack? Right. You know, like if they it's don't run right away, first. okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I'm just making sure, just making sure. Order of operations is important. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, there's there's definitely something to be said for somebody trying to sow seeds of doubt in, in a courtroom environment. And if you are in a pitch black house, 
as edifice by your really awesome networked fucking Wi-Fi cameras that are that are filming onto your DVR, and they're all showing fucking night IR mode, and then you can easily see the muzzle flashes from the pistol, and then three minutes after the shoot, all the fucking lights are turned on, and then you're a dumbass when the cop said, how did you know he was armed? You said, because I could see him because the lights are on, and you perjure yourself to an investigating officer, just turn a very ruling, very righteous, clean fucking shoot into manslaughter. Because your home, your home security camera ain't telling the same story you're telling to the police officer. Now, if you had a little bit of sprinkle some crack on him, now you're really fucked. So turn your flashlight on, see who you're going to shoot, see why you're going to shoot him, shoot him, then turn on all the lights and be fucking honest about it. I was well, right. Honesty's best policy. Boy Scouts taught me that shit. Who'd have known they were setting me up to be a fucking good justifiable homicide guy? Now, you guys who are in the military and you guys who are on SWAT teams, the Chucks especially, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to pose a question for the benefit of the Internet. You guys operated under what would be considered some of the more permissive rules of engagement that are possibly to be allowed because we expect you to be to go where bad guys are and to mess their stuff up. That's the nature of your job. But in that job, were you not required to positively identify threats before you shot them, even as a professional? No. Yes. That is not true. I would. <laughs> no. no. There, there's, the, the bottom line is, is that the, the use of force authorized after 9-11 extended to specific organizations. The problem becomes because they don't, that Al Qaeda and the Taliban don't wear a, a really sharp gray uniform with a fucking pitch fucking helmet and jack boots. Uh, in order for us to say that guy's Taliban, he has to do Taliban shit. Or I have to know who the fucking guy is. If that is Abu Dakma, and Abu Dakma is a fucking positively identified Taliban guy, he gets. No fucking quarter any different than the guys unarmed running away from Dick Twitters and the 88 and fucking Band of Brothers. Oh, you're not surrendering or fucking wounded? Get some of this Tommy gun on the back, bitch. <laughs> fucking first use of deadly force is authorized against known enemy combatants. So I have the ability to articulate demeanor and how I know that a dude is a fucking mooch and he's mooching out. A weapon is just the easiest way for me to do that. But I could fucking hose the dude for a lot of other reasons. Right. You still had to make the argument, though, that now SWAT team guys, of course, it's a little different, right, Chuck? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you're uh, the, the the law of the land being uh, Graham B. Connor and Garner versus Tennessee, you absolutely better be in compliance with those things. Um, and uh, in like in, in the state of Kansas, <clears throat> the way the statutes are written, they basically mirror Graham B. Connor, Garner versus Tennessee. Uh, the civilian self-defense statutes are basically written around uh, old uh, common law and Graham v. Connor. Yet it has to be a reasonable articulation. You have to reasonably articulate why you thought you were under the threat of death or great bodily harm. Um, one of the things I'll throw out, there was a case a few months ago, maybe about a year ago now, uh, and I know people will poo-poo the idea, well, you know, I don't have kids. Uh, nobody else comes in my house, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> well, there was a young man um, in the news here a while back. Somebody was uh, outside, looked like they were breaking in his car, looked like he had a prowler. He goes outside, confronts the guy. He articulates his dude lurching towards him. He burns him down. It turns out to be a tall, 70-something-year-old Alzheimer patient who walked away from a care facility. And... It, he, you know, goes outside without a plan, without a light. All he's got is a gun. And he's got a dark, mysterious figure uh, heading in his direction that's not listening to what he has to say. I've heard cases of uh, drunks. You know, you just got a lost drunk knocking on the wrong door. Teenagers sneaking in and out of houses. Alzheimer's patients. Um, uh, missing mentally retarded kids that, uh, you know, have Down syndrome, stuff like that. People being killed in situations like this because they didn't respond 
how the person thought they should to some sort of voice command, back up or show me your hands or whatever. And what the person, what the shooter never did was confirm what they feared. Uh, and I, I don't know about anybody else. I think you'd have to be a fucking sociopath to be able to live with something like that. I burned down an Alzheimer's patient uh, because I didn't have my shit together out in my carport. How do you live with that? Um, and, you know, that goes down to people ask the question, well, when can I shoot? That's the wrong question. You know, you should be looking for your opportunities. Uh, there were a real good series of articles on uh, modern service weapons, the can, should, and must. Pretty much you ought to not be pulling the trigger until you're in the, at least the should or the must, not just because you can. Uh, you know, if I had shot everybody I could legally shoot in my career, I wouldn't have gotten anything else done. You know, I could have legally shot a whole lot of people and then came back to work after an investigation and went and shot somebody else. It's ridiculous to think in that, in that kind of, that kind of mental mode. You know, it's sad, and this is not on the list, but usually when I encounter this type of a mindset, when can I shoot? Well, Ca Castle Doctrine says I can. No, it does not. Castle Doctrine has mm -hmm. nothing to do with this. Internet gun store lawyers cause more damage than anybody else in the business, you know? It, my, 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 what I tell people is you shoot when you know you have to. When you are convinced to your toes, there is no alternative here. It, it, it's either do this now or I'm going to die. If you're not in that yeah. position, and I would encourage you, you know, Chuck just mentioned it, the guy who goes out to the Alzheimer's patient, one of Tom Gibbons' good maxims, don't go looking for trouble unless you expect to find it, right? If I see there's a dude messing around with my car, it could be something that I could easily deal with, or it could be, and I, I look at it from, is it worth a gunfight for this? Is it worth having to explain my hollow points and somebody else to do this? And the answer is almost always no. It has to be something really, really valuable, something really important for me to be willing to go to that step. So I'll call the police because I have good insurance. They'll take 35 minutes to show up. He'll probably have stolen the car by then. It's a stick shift, so maybe not. Uh, and that's what the insurance is for. I would much rather go through that than have to go through the aftermath of the shooting because I got myself into something I could not handle and had to shoot my way out of the middle of. Most folks do not have the uh, resources that, or the experience to get themselves out of those kinds of situations. Because here, here's another little fun thing that people need to understand. A lot of bad guys aren't impressed by your gun. They've dealt with more violent people than you as a matter of course. You don't scare them, by and large. They will, they will test you, they will prod you, and if they sense um, hesitation or they sense uh, – a good video is the one to watch where the uh, police officer got dragged by a Haitian national. is getting dragged around by the foot. If you watch the whole video of that, you can tell the tale in that like split second when the guy sizes up this police officer and the police officer is scared. And you can tell by his body language and the guy just charges right after him. That's how most people look. Now, this is a police officer. He is openly carrying a firearm and he has all the authority that comes along with it. But in that moment, he was not intimidating to that other guy and the other guy attacked. And he had to be rescued by somebody else who came on scene and basically shot the guy because he didn't have anything for him. And you could tell by the way he was acting. You aren't scary to bad people unless you have extensive experience dealing with bad people. Some of the guys on this panel can scare bad people. Uh, you probably not. Me, I have two, my cherubic good looks don't allow me to scare people very easily. So don't get yourself involved in something that you can't get yourself out of. It's not worth messing around with don't shoot unless you have to be and, and because you know like chuck said i mean if chuck shot everybody he could shoot while he was on duty he wouldn't have been on duty very long that's right? a lot of vacation yeah i mean you, you can only be in so many shootings before you're going to get in the old days you know when it was sort of the old west they didn't care but nowadays if you're in two or three shootings it, <laughs> you better really think hard I mean, think about that. You guys with law enforcement experience, how many guys do you know that have been in, in, in the law enforcement side that have been in multiple 
uh, lethal force incidents. It doesn't that get brought up when they are yeah. in the it, that that's completely department by department and and the department is is basing off of the proclivities of of the people the populace around them we we all know dudes that are in jurisdictions where it's kind of cool and it's okay it's just the cost of doing business and we know officers that are still active there that have four and five ois and they're fine um if you were in, you know, other departments, on your third, that VA shooting team is probably all in your shit for number three. Two is lightning strikes, whatever. Number three, that's a fucking pattern. And that that shoot probably, um, it, it's going to be rough. It's going to be an uphill for no reason. Like, like it could have been... You know, five Nazis with chainsaws beheading nuns. Uh, but number three, that's number three, man. We're putting quotas on some shit, and uh, you know, and, and and that's and that's the one where the the Punisher fucking uh, backplate on your Glock is, is gonna hit you. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it, it is what it is. Um, Chuck's point. Uh, Chuck's point about uh, uh, the old and the infirm and all that. You know, it, it reminded me of the fact that I ran across an abnormally large population of mentally um, uh, retarded people in the Middle East. And, and part of that is, you could say it's because of tribal inbreeding, but the other piece of it is the thing that in the Middle East, for right or wrong, uh, a family member is a family member. You don't see homeless people in the Middle East. They'll take a severely mentally um, jacked up person, there's no, you know, institution for that person to go to. They'll lock them in the fucking basement in their house. And uh, so you'll see severely uh, physically and mentally handicapped people that there is no way would ever be in a regular household in uh, the United States. And you see them with great frequency overseas in the Middle East. So much so that when we saw people through our demeanor, through demeanor in our night vision, if somebody had a closer vantage point and could make a reasonable assertion that, hey man, I think that guy over there in blue is uh, is retarded, that's going on over the radio net. Everyone on that target is going to know we potentially have a mentally retarded male suspect, uh, so expect non-compliance because we don't want PGov, provincial governor. We don't we don't want PGov showing up the next day, which he's going to do, hear whatever story comes out of the locals, which is never going to be right, and, and have a dead retarded kid to put on top of that cherry when he takes that shit to somebody like President Karzai and says the Americans are evil. So, uh, so you just can't go around shooting retarded people. It's just not cool. So uh, you know, it, it's, it's all part of the overall package of just because that guy didn't show me his hands, that doesn't necessarily – mean that I've crossed this imaginary threshold where now it's Ali Ali oxen free. I can do whatever I want and I'm not going to go to jail. I, I might not go to jail, but I might set back U.S. foreign policy. I might create a, a lawsuit of my department, um, wasting millions of taxpayer dollars and potentially putting fellow officers in danger because of a perception movement like Black Lives Matter that is now going to be more openly hostile to others trying to do their job. I mean, there's the second, third order effects of any time you employ firearm are, are huge. They're in their huge. Amen. There's, uh, <clears throat> there's something to be said for having smarts. And like, it's, it gets hard for me to explain it to people at times. Um, because people ask us, well, they ask for the formulaic, they ask you a formulaic question for a situation and say, can I shoot them now? Right. Um, they're so busy looking for ones and zeros that they're not actually like reading the room and they're not reading behaviors and stuff. Right. Um, just like uh, what, what Chuck was saying a second ago about, uh, or no, when Chuck, it was a, uh, as Tim was talking about, like real bad guys don't care about a gun. Um, a couple years ago, I, I was telling about the time we got had the flat tire. Those dudes didn't give a shit about our faces. Um, at the same time, street smarts prevailed and experience prevailed, obviously, and we were able to um, evaluate this the situation uh, constantly. 
um, constantly watching for hand movement, watching their eyes, watching their orientation, watching body shifts in their seats and stuff. We're standing for a long period of time with guns on them. Um, sometimes that, that, that orange blinking, blinking green or blinking red can change and go the other direction really, really quickly, or it could just go flat orange and not progress any further or yellow. Um, no, no, it, there's a lot of things like a lot of these videos that tend to start these conversations is, you know, right ways, wrong ways, or it's a justification of a technique or piece of equipment. When really the questions that should be asked about these scenarios p depicted in these videos, um, the questions that should be asked are what kind of stupid fucked up decisions did these people make that day when they got out of bed that led them to this unwinnable, untenable position where they are forced to pick the best of the shittiest in that moment um, to, to try to save their own life or just not die a horrible death. Um, there was one just the other day that there's a big discussion on and I'm just sitting here looking at it like, what's the debate about? Like this motherfucker shouldn't have even been in this situation to begin with. Like nobody should have been there. Nobody should have been involved. Oh, is that one of the dudes pointing airsoft out the window? That's what it was. It's like a whole, a whole morning or evening's worth of a, uh, Stupid, just no situational awareness, no street smarts that led to a shitty situation where people that are given a set of rules and they have a whole bunch of unknowns and a high degree of stress placed on them are going to be forced to make life and death decisions. Um, I know it's just not talked about enough is how to get through life without getting into shit. Right. And I, I don't think folks understand that when things start to go bad, your decision tree rapidly closes right the options available to you are only there as long as you're able to process them most people's processing power is very easily overwhelmed and at the more overwhelmed you get the more constrained you get and you're being funneled towards an end that you don't want unless you're the kind of person who is either just naturally able to think under that kind of pressure which there are some people who are naturally gifted that way and even those guys, we spend a lot of time and money training them to be able to be flexible thinkers under the worst possible circumstances. Bob, the accountant, Tim, the IT guy, we don't have that level of training. So we have to be a lot more reticent about what we step our foot into because there's a gravity to that decision and it can pull us down a hole we don't really want to go down. Uh, those of you out there watching in internet land, if you've never been a class with uh, Craig Douglas, who was on a couple of weeks ago, his classes are fantastic for taking you as an ordinary citizen or even as a police officer who, frankly, and I'm sure uh, Chuck Haggard will agree with this and the other guys here who have law enforcement experience, police officers are not trained enough in decision making under stress. Uh, some departments do okay with it. Most of them do not. Um, if it's a civilian, though, you have absolutely no exposure to that outside of a class like Craig's where you where you actually start to see and you can you can watch it when people when you're an observer, you can watch their brain shrink. You can watch it go as their their rational decision making leaves them and until they're just left with that little angry walnut at the back there acting in a pure reptilian survival mode where they just start shooting everything that moves. Do your best not to put yourself under those kinds of stressors if you can help it. Right. Leave it to the professionals. And maybe Chuck can talk about, you know, the, the lack of preparedness for we're doing for law enforcement officers in that respect. That's uh, that that's pretty much dead on uh, the, the vast majority of the, the academy type training that I see, especially small departments, lowest common denominator stuff. Uh, they are not equipping people to handle situations like what, what you're talking to. A lot of guys pick that up on the street. If they're active, if they're good, they'll pick it up as they go. Um, learning by doing, doing it live, probably not the best way to do business. Um, you know, cause if you screw that up, the, the, the price for failure is pretty high. Uh, but you know, when just, just little, little things that are fairly simple, shoot, don't shoot decisions, uh, back when I was running our program, we would do uh, all of our recruits were with the SWAT team for a week doing scenario training. And one of our culminating exercises was an active shooter uh, training event. And we would, uh, to steal a line from Rich Mason, 
uh, leave them meant or emotionally attached to a mistake. <clears throat> uh, we would put uh, a contact team into, into a simulated school. They would take shots. They would have a shooter at the end of the hallway that would duck. And their dispatch call beforehand, they were told that there was a uniformed school resource officer on scene calling in the school shooter. And that guy would step out in the hallway between them and where the, uh, where the, the, uh, the real active shooter was at, full uniform cop. The first time that happened, every single run, every single recruit class, every single squad that went through, that uniform officer got burned down because he had a, because he had a gun in his hand. That was training that we, we put people through that was not normal to see in a law enforcement academy, that type of targeted discrimination training. Um, and I point that out to people uh, when they come up with fantasies like truck guns and, you know, they're going to save the day and things like that. I've seen every single recruit class I ran through that scenario initially burn down a uniform officer during the course of the scenario knowing, being briefed ahead of time, that there was a uniform cop in the scenario. So uh, they would quickly pick up on that mistake. They would quickly make uh, better shoot-don't-shoot decision-making. They would quickly uh, be emotionally attached to that mistake. But how many people get a chance to go through that type of process? Even in the cop world, it's fairly rare. Uh, um, I just a, got. I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say gonna... in the civilian world, if it, it concealed carry stuff, a lot of times your decision tree is simpler. Uh, if you are a clerk at a store and a guy walks in with a gun and and says, "Give me all the money," uh, you know that's not. There's not much target ID required on that one. But there's other things you got to think about. Did they bring a partner? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. If it's a street robbery, if it's the type of scenario that, uh, that Tim was talking about, Craig Douglas sets up in his ECQC classes, it's going to be a much more complex scenario because you're going to be trying to maybe access gear while you're taking a beat down, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think there's enough success in real life when you read like the armed citizen and the, in the national uh, rifleman magazine where you see, you know, grandmother shoots a dude crawling through her window. Eh, wouldn't, wouldn't have a really tough problem to solve. Uh, but uh, what you don't see in the armed citizen is the number of negative outcomes, people shooting the wrong people, killing the Alzheimer's patient, shooting their daughter's uh, boyfriend, um, not winning the fight that kind of thing that's not showing up in that column so i think people get a false sense of security that works for me is really working that well yeah can i, can I jump on that please go ahead I, I just want to say from a civilian standpoint like all that stuff is interrelated you know when you got a guy who's like well i've got castle doctrine so so you know we've all we got the castle doctrine anybody comes to my house i'm you know i'm gonna I'm going to shoot them. I'm going to, I, and I'll be okay. It's like, well, no. And then, you know, it's the same thing as like that wraps into, that's the same guy that's asking, when can I shoot? You know, he's not asking it for the right reason. And that's the same, you know, on the civilian side, you know, and that's the same dude that, you know, does it, who said to each his own because, you know, he's taking it back to him buying a 1911 because it's all ego. And but he also lives to, and he can, <laughs> defend, he can use deadly right, force for right. property. Right. But it's like you know he he bought that 1911 you know because he was trying to buy tough confidence, and that shit it doesn't translate. And when you when you've bought that false confidence and you're operating under this false confidence of because I live in Texas and I got castle doctrine and I'm going to be okay. And, you know, maybe that extends to maybe you going into places that you should be going to. Right. Dog. You need to calm the fuck down. Because you ain't that dude. It's living condition white. Right. It's living right. condition white, oblivious. Right. Bad decisions just... rarely come by themselves. They often run in packs. 
and there's certain mindsets and a lot of this stuff that, that uh, Matt put on the list we've talked about so far, there's a certain uh, strain of thinking, a diseased pattern of thinking, for lack of a better term, that produces all of this stuff, right? Because it's, it's we, we're all talking about this and I guarantee you every one of us has at least four or five examples in our head of who we know that guy is, right? And you, you find it invariably. Everything we'll talk about tonight, it comes from the same thing. And this is really like an intervention to the Internet at large. Uh, if you know someone like this, <laughs> get them help. This is this is the help. This is the help. This is our Christmas gift to you and them. And, and I, I love the, the comment about the decision tree getting smaller. And it absolutely gets exponentially smaller with those bad decisions, you know. Um, uh, law enforcement are equipped with a, a much larger uh, toolkit in their use of force uh, continuum than, than the average citizen. But with that responsibility, you know, with that power comes that great responsibility to choose the right tool in the Batman utility belt and blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, if you are a 90 pound female officer and you're in a, a bar altercation with a really big dude, your presence going into that right there is going to dictate some shit. And if you start one way and then realize it's not going that way, uh, you better be looking at changing your shit because, like you're saying, that bad cascades of events normally go backwards. So we end up with a dead six foot four unarmed drunk guy. But before that, there was some, in, uh, some ineffective use of pepper spray. There's probably a bad taser fucking employment thrown in there and uh you know it all started out with i decided i was going to go hands on but i was by myself because i knew the cover was coming and, and instead of realizing dude this guy's going to go you either need to do one or two things go full lesbian over the top and show him you're the worst 95 pounds that have ever been fucked with or maybe switch gears and get chatty with this fucking guy until five of your buddies with police cars show up and then renegotiate the fucking hands-on approach and, and, but once you start running your mouth or doing other things, now your decisions are rapidly dwindling and you start reaching for various shit on your back belt and, and you end up with a disparity of force um, justification for a deadly use of force. Does, does that make sense? Like all of that shit. Not saying at that time when she's on her back and she's getting those fucking bombs dropped on her, that defeating that shit and firing up from retention was the wrong tactical move. It wasn't. It was her only tactical move at that point. What the fuck happened prior to that to end up with a 95-pound chick on her back firing from retention up into an unarmed drunk guy? See what I'm saying? Right. And that's, that's fucking spot on, bro. And it's crucial, it's circumstances. Especially, it's crucial for citizens, ordinary citizens, to understand that your entire decision tree from that moment all the way back to when the problem started or was coming where that is all going to come up in an investigation that you're in. It happens to police officers. It is damn sure going to happen to you, which is why you have to think strategically about what you involve yourself in. If you have a badge and you've sworn an oath, you're supposed to go out and find trouble. That's your job description. People call you for help. If you don't have that, you need to mind your own business. Threats to your family, threats to you. Okay, you deal with that as best you can, but don't go getting yourself involved in stuff you don't have to because if it ends like that, and people never see it that way, they never think that something that starts off with me going, hey, dude, knock that off, results in somebody laying on the ground bleeding to death. But it can happen like that because like Chuck said, like I said, the decision tree, once you start down that path, your options disappear. They may be there, but you don't see them anymore because your brain dwindles. The rational part of your brain, you can see it roll all the way back until all you have is this emotional core of survive. Reptilian, I must win, I must fight, I must do, I must run. You don't want to be there. And most people don't have the experience to keep themselves in this rational part of our brain that actually says, hey, I don't have to participate in this dance of stupidity with this jackass. I can walk away and let the cops deal with it. Think um, strategically about what you involve yourself in. NASA, NASA after the Challenger explosion, they you know they did the investigation on what went wrong, and somebody came up with a pyramid of disaster, 
And so basically the base of the pyramid was all these low order failures that they were living with for these shuttle launches and all the low order failures that they lived with uh, for the Challenger shuttle launch. And that was the base of the pyramid. And then cumulatively, they ended up being into higher and higher level failures. And on this pyramid, it's it's not like the ones in Egypt where they're set. The great, so the greater your base of low order failure, Years of shit that you're alive. This is from the base to the top of the pyramid. It's closer and closer and closer. No problem. Look at it that way. Like all these low order failures that you're living with, you're extending the base, but the height of the pyramid is shrinking. You know, so it's just another way to think about it. That's cool. It's a cascading effect. Yes. And uh, whenever failures cascade, it's usually like. A whole lot of littles make up big really quick, and it gains momentum, and you can't change it. Um, there's something that that transcends this, and that's the color code, and uh, people, you know, Cooper's color codes, and um, people tend to like walk through life in condition white, and that's oblivious. And whenever they are oblivious, or if they're going through an oblivious mindset, meaning um, they think they own the situation they're in without a, a realistic self-image um, or self-estimation of their own abilities and skills. Uh, that's where you get to people like playing the verbal loop, telling somebody to drop it 400 times in a row, and they never drop it. They keep playing the tape, hoping for a different change. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can talk about there. Well, let's, we actually let's have. Go a, oh, I remember what else I was going to say. There's a. We have a uh, interesting situation here locally, where we have a special needs male who's late teens, early twenties, and he is cock strong, country boy, and he's very uh, autistic, and um, and he's got a lot of other layered issues there, and he's been involved in several instances. One of which, my wife was in the gas station when it happened, and. Uh, randomly attacks women and uh, he attacked the he attacked like three women right in front of my wife in the in the gas station um and then he started opening up like things like uh, windshield cleaners and like oil and stuff like in the gas station throwing them at women and stuff and everybody's just like backing off like nobody's wanting to get a hold of it um and i find this out after the fact i'm like holy shit like what is going on then i found out later on that he's like a repeat offender and stuff and it went and went and went because, like, one, like, people don't want to get hand, handsy with a with a dude that's, like, retard strong. And they don't want to be the dude that beats the shit out of it. Um, they're special needs. Well, it turns out, happened again. And uh, one of our good dudes, one of our good deputies, uh, well, they're all good. Um, he rolled up on it. And he's a new guy. And he's, he's very comfortable with his hands. He's a very headstrong dude, very skilled dude. He rolls up. This dude wants to go, and uh, he's like, "This dude's strong, and he's going to get the best of me." So he went straight to OC. Now, if you know anything about autism, like they are raw nerve with no shielding. Like they sense on every piece of that nerve. Right? He got hit with OC, and it just like, might as well just set him on fire. Like, just just wreck that dude. Um, and he ended up having to get handsy with him after that, to just to control the guy. Like the state of the system like it's not you know it's not like middle east where the family will take care of them yeah the family will somewhat take care of them to keep them out of the institution that will keep them safe and others safe from them and so now he just periodically has a blow up out in town and attacks women and he's like 230 pound dude that's like fit but no qualms of punching a chick right in the face for no reason other than she just looked at him but anyways no. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like King Kong attacked the attacked Lewisburg, you know. Like, oh, here he comes again. They drop another building. Someone brought that up in chat. At how do you deal with that? But part of that is part of that is thinking clearly. That's for one. If well, the, if those physical, those uh, those physical cues. Like, I mean, if somebody's not right, usually you can tell. Well, first of all, they're just like 
doing weird erratic behavior. You know, they're at least an EDP, right? Um, guess it depends on where you're at. Here, people know him. Like that deputy didn't know him yet because he just he was like months out of the academy, right? So he hadn't been around for half a year to get all the backstory on this one dude. So he just kind of walked into it and rapidly assumed that this not right and that you know this that and the other. But a big city, I don't even know how you even even try to get around it. Street smarts, man. You just got to pay attention to people. Read them from a desk before you close this. So our next topic. And before I do that, I have a shout out. And the, sh the shout out is firearms, 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 firearms. <laughs> if anyone understands what I'm saying, it's then they're hopefully it's the in range. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. So you're on that too. Yeah. So in in range TV, they have a drinking game going on right now in their uh, discord. And they're going to take a drink every time someone on the panel says firearms. Hey, I said it again, firearms. So I, I'm hoping that someone has a good time with this. Uh, next topic. This was written in by one of our listeners. This was sent to me exclusively. Matt Wicks, thanks for calling this in. As far as the uh, military is concerned, the misconception of Lois Bitter. <laughs> Come on, Mike. <laughs> well, before we start, I will say, people used to ask, why would you jump out of a perfectly good aircraft? I will tell you right now, if the United States Air Force is flying it, it is not a perfectly good aircraft. <laughs> it may be airworthy, but it is not perfectly good. <laughs> oh, man. Now, on that, the lowest bidder, yeah. Um, that comes into procurements, obviously, but it's not the lowest bidder. There there are, and Chad, Chad's probably much better versed at this than I am, um, there are requirements that shall be met. It doesn't matter if the lowest bidder is the lowest bidder. Guess what? The Army ain't buying high points. You know, I'm pretty sure they would have been the lowest bidder if they competed for the XM-17. But the requirement must be met. And if the requirement is met, then they look at a, a, a few factors, uh, cost being one of them. They also look at the best as well as others. Chad, would you care to add on? As soon as I can find my arrow to unmute it. Um, yeah, if there is a lowest bidder, there's actually people in place be it on, on the customer side, um, that agency or military, there's people in place that are supposed to review those awards. And so if it is a true lowest bidder that's done you crap, it's on them to make sure that we aren't getting crap. And I've had to sit and go back and forth with you know, La Fonda on the phone while she's doing her nails and tell her why Botash's knockoff D balls are not Peck 15s. And, you know, God, whatever brand it is that Israeli knockoff of the EOTech, which is probably better, but like, you know, 16 pages of, of kit that, most of it was swapped liked or as good as you know supposedly according to them and now we have to spend our time showing that it's you know not as good as or it's just not what we want um but yeah there's there's actually a whole system in place and um and chuck pressburg definitely knows it way better than any of us here as on the military side especially as far as um procurement but you know the final say is on the on the on the customer to say, yeah, this is what we want. We're going to take it, and then it takes a due diligence to do that and to follow through if it's not what you want, and to say no, not awarding that contract. Cool. It's been a while. I'm a little rusty on my verbiage, and like I said, I gave up and I started drinking the Yingling. So, woohoo! Um, next one we have. This one, this one will be a fun one for you guys. Every attack 
is an ambush. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, Tom talks about. He, Tom Gibbons was an investigator before he did the training thing. And uh, he, he saw over and over again, he remarks on his instructor course, saying that a guy came out of nowhere. And you can watch video and know he didn't come out of nowhere. Your head was just up your third point of contact and you didn't see him coming. Right. Fourth point of contact. I'm not good on my military terms lately. But uh, yeah, I mean, it seems that way if you're not paying attention. It's remarkable how much people who pay attention notice and they don't seem to have these sorts of problems. Right. So uh, every attack is not. Yeah, it's intended to be. But if you pull your head out of your ass, you'll probably see most of them coming. You know, there was a classic example of that. Oh, last year, it's been about a year and a half. Tragic event um, in Virginia. There was a, a reporter and her cameraman that were shot on live TV. Um, yeah, I watched the video a couple times, not because of, you know, just dark personality, but more to glean AAR out of it. And, you know, there was an online conversation I got into with an individual whose big thing was, I don't think situational awareness means what you think it means. Well, hell, what the hell is situational awareness? It's being aware of your surroundings. You know, these poor people were killed because they had zero situational awareness. The shooter displayed multiple pre-attack indicators to include standing within spitting distance of them and pointing a Glock at the young lady. It, he held the Glock on her for like 20 seconds. How in God's name is that an ambush? But he was saying, that was an ambush. That was an ambush. No, dude, that was not an ambush. They had every opportunity, if they had had the situational awareness, to see that coming. Um, the problem there is, you know, like Chad said, people walk around in conditioned white. Um, and they people take this fatalistic approach. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Every attack is an ambush. It came out of nowhere. You know, the Army has a school, uh, the Advanced Situational Awareness Training. The Marine Corps has a similar school. I think it's the Hunter, something Hunter. Um, there's a book, and these programs are, you know, in line with the book Left of Bang. And all that is is looking for behavioral patterns, looking for group dynamics, and looking for anomalies it's it's just a matter of seeing anomalies whether it's things out of place whether it's behavioral patterns whether it's facial expressions whether it's clenched fists all of these things are in play and if you're not looking for these things you know tim mentioned the the angry walnut and the reptilian brain we've heard about the um the decision trees we've we've heard about processor speed all of these things are in play. They're in play all the time. They're more in play if you think, oh, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. There's nothing I can do because it's an ambush. Quit fooling yourself. You know, try, try, make an attempt to leave yourself a chance for, for your processing to work. You know, don't just think, oh, if I'm going to get shot, I'm going to get, get shot. It's stupid. Chuck Haggard, firearms, firearms, do you have anything? Besides firearms? <laughs> yeah, firearms. <clears throat> um, you know, that what what he was just talking about, I, I unfortunately see that in police work a lot, and that's the people that don't want to do the work. Um, they get fatalistic about stuff. Well, you know, if it's my time, it's my time. Yeah, that a long, long time ago, I heard a saying that, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm going to screw it up. But uh, basically, the gist of it is that pe people talk about, well, you know, if it's your, if it's your time, it's your time, or if you've got good luck. Um, luck is where preparation meets opportunity, in my opinion. People make their own luck. Uh, it, it, it's intellectually lazy to buy off on the whole, well, if it's my time, it's my time. It, it, it just don't get it. You know, it, how far do you take that? If it's, well, if it's never going to happen to me, then why are you, why are you even carrying a gun? Why are 
why are you know why are we even police officers? Um, you know, they're, they're, if it's if it's you know, there's clearly nothing we can do about it. Uh, so it, it, it's an intellectually lazy thing where people put off these intrusive, unpleasant thoughts that something bad really can't happen to them. You know, the if if you get hit by a meteor. I guess it was your time, but typically things like that aren't what we're talking about. People set themselves up for failure very, very badly. And firearms. Every firearms, firearms, firearms. Every attack is not an ambush, but every attack is a conversation. Right? There is a give and there is a take going on here. You have a predator who is sizing up. They're just like, if you watch documentaries on lions, how do they operate? That's pretty much exactly how criminals operate. They are looking for certain traits. They are looking for vulnerability. And there are certain things that you do that communicate that vulnerability, that communicate you are a good candidate for an attack. You don't realize you're streaming this information out into the world, but you are. If folks out there, if you've never listened to William April stuff, he does a fantastic job covering this. The poor man's version of it is you are perpetually streaming information about yourself out there. And we understand that, right? When you're going to go make a speech that's important, do you wear your mustard stained wife beater and some ripped up sweatpants? No. Put on a suit, you put on a tie, you shave, but you police that mustache just so, right? We're communicating something about ourselves to the intended audience. You're doing that when you're walking in the parking lot of a Walmart. You're doing that when you're stopping Rob whether you understand it or not. And there are bad people out there looking for those cues. So it's not always an ambush, but it is a conversation. And it's a conversation that you can turn to your advantage. If you signal the right stuff, he'll pick some other dude, right? I mean, there, there's a reason why you don't see people who are eager to start a fight with a six foot six guy with massive muscles and a freaking bicep vein that's the size of a garden hose who has a swastika tattooed on his forehead. Who's starting to fight with that guy? Nobody. Because just looking at him, you realize this is going to be a bad time, right? You can have about the same effect on criminals just by paying attention to what you're doing. You're communicating, I'm aware you're out there, and I got a plan for you. And they will go, no, I'll pick somebody else. Well, it's like... You know, when somebody says, you know, if it's my time, it's my time, and it rolls back into to each his own and to all that other stuff, it's like they get it, like, from fortune cookies made by assholes. <laughs> and, that and, don't carry firearms, firearms. Well, firearms. And, and here's the thing. It's like, let's be honest. When somebody says, if it's my time, it's my time, then they've already quit. Right. Whether there's me a civilian or somebody on duty i can only imagine like what you guys have alluded to like a lot of these people not only are they on duty like me i got to take care of myself these people on duty got to take care of other people and that's got to be a shitty situation to be in when you're working with somebody who's basically you know has already quit and that's how i assess that i mean you guys are the pros you let me know how you feel have you ever seen uh kung pao the movie there's a big fight the scene. Cartoon? You know, with no, the cow, the movie, the, the movie. With the yeah, where, where they're they're lined up on the field of battle, y'all these samurais and ninjas, right? And uh, old Kung Pao, whatever his name was, he gets out there and he does this crazy shit with his tongue and starts beating everybody's ass, right? And the, and on the other side, you got that one super ninja, and like he throws his ninja smoke, poof, and he goes, and he just walks away defeated, right? Well. Like those little sayings are like their verbal ninja smoke. It's like I've had enough. I'm throwing my ninja smoke. I'm out. Poof. I don't know where I'm going with that, but I'm just saying it's ninja smoke. They're they're throwing out smoke. They're throwing shade your face, trying to disengage. It's a verbal disengagement from, from the, uh, yep. Really being called a task on something that's a, was probably stupid. How dare you push really. me to confront my inadequacies? Yeah, like I could. <laughs> Whoever said that at every attack is an ambush is very shallow thinking because having gone through an actual formal school for infantry tactics, they could have cut like eight weeks out of that if that was true. <laughs> like seriously. Like there's two parties to an ambush. You have the ambusher who's static in one of a few positions, right? In a prepared spot. And they have a 
plan for egress. And then you have your ambush E, who is oblivious, going through life, and traits through the X to their demise, right? Like, one static, one's moving. I don't know of any ambushes where you're actually moving. I, I'm dated my information and my training, evidently. I don't know, man. They, I could have gone with, like, eight less weeks of SOI because that was some bullshit. Damn, Chad. We could have just trimmed, like, 50 pages out of the Ranger handbook, dude. Two battle <laughs> drills. Two battle drills. React to near ambush, react to far ambush. Training complete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Left face, attack. Right face, attack. There you go. Okay, have a, have a new one for you. This one I think you guys might enjoy. But the Israelis do it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that, that whole, the, the chamber empty carry, that is the thing everybody, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to explain the history to people that this was a ragtag military that had literally no one would sell them guns, that they had to pick up whatever the hell they could find, and you had to come up with a manual of arms to teach a bunch of people who are not trained soldiers to be able to actually functionally use a weapon. And that if you're not facing those constraints, it's sort of like the point shooting argument, right? You know, the reason why they taught point shooting in Shanghai was because they had like 12 rounds of ammunition to train these guys with, and their qual was three yards to put 50% of their shots on a man-sized target or something like that. We're not forced to live under those constraints. We can do better than that. And, it, it, and, and in a military context, rarely is a handgun a primary weapon. It is a secondary weapon. Those guys are rocking a rifle most of the time. They're rocking a carbine or a tank, right? It's not the weapon they are employed to. But if you're a citizen or you're a police officer, unless you're on a tack team, that gun is plan A. That is your primary weapon. You don't have the luxury of a long gun that you transition to a handgun and you have that time. You're not operating in a team environment. You're entirely by yourself and you don't have a control over what circumstances you're going to be into. I mean, again, Craig Douglas's classes are fantastic for that. The number of people who are able to successfully draw their gun when there's actually physical contact between them and the other guy in that class, which you only you typically get fairly well-trained people showing up to, it's got to be no more than like 35 or 40 percent. I mean, when I went through it, I, I didn't see very many people succeed at it at all. They had to work really hard before they could get in a position where they could actually successfully draw their gun. And the kind of person who doesn't have the training, who thinks that Israeli carry is a good idea, is exactly the kind of person who doesn't have that preparation, who has that severely narrow decision tree, and they're going to go right for that gun immediately and they're probably not going to be able to successfully get it out. There's the illusion that I will have plenty of time from people who have never bothered to put themselves on a timer or who insist there's no timer in a gunfight. You know, time runs in a fight like water. It, it's three seconds and it's done. It's a limited time opportunity. And handicapping yourself, and there's plenty of videos out there too, and you can watch people trying to get a gun into action and they don't get into action and they get killed. Your, your opportunity to do something to save the streets is limited, very, very limited. You know, you only have, they only last three to five seconds, the typical one. That's not a lot of time. And if that three to five seconds is all the other guy doing offensive action against you, it's not going to be a good day for you. So for the love of Christ, carry with a round in the chamber. Get training so you don't shoot yourself. If you're properly trained, that won't be a problem. But... The fact that some Israeli conscript does it somewhere else, that ain't you, that ain't your world, that ain't your problem. Deal with what you've got to deal with. And now I'll got, shut up. I got two <laughs> things. I got two things. One, consider the vanquished. Right. Consider the vanquished there. And the second one being, I think the last time that we got anything militarily relevant as far as tactics from the Izzies, it involved D9 dozers and hippies. <laughs> That's terrible. Can I, can I say something? I, I just want to say, like, read the street signs, dude. We're in America. <laughs> just like what you said. Go do that shit in Israel. You in Israel? Do that in Israel, motherfucker. You in America? You know, it's like... America. Right. It's like, it's like if a Desert Eagle was so great, how come I don't see the IDF using them? You know what I'm saying? Like... Come on, dude. And guys can look real cool on YouTube demonstrating their Israeli draw where they do this thing. Oh, and they come up. 
Hey, are it's you like, talking about when I get those ledge sights on my firearm? So I can like <laughs> rack it off myself. Right. Or, or they have the holster that you actually press down and rack it. The kind of, it's like, no, if you don't live in those good space, and, and if you put those guys on the timer that are doing their real, real super duper, whip it out and rack it really hard and then present, it's a lot faster just to go bang. You know, uh, instead of having all that unnecessary crap, just get the gun out and freaking shoot it. And, and it's become it's become something that had, a, and this is a problem in firearms industry and in this realm in general. We're talking about earlier, and I think it's the pre-show about, you know, old, old information that won't die. It's something that they had for a particular situation that made sense in that situation. But now it's become a religion. And everybody wants to go to war over something that has no relevance, no application to the realities of what we're dealing with. If you're dealing with shittily manufactured guns that can potentially go off with the drop of a hat, you know, if you've got a talker rev and they had some of those, yeah, you don't carry that with a brown in the chamber because there's no safety in it. It was a gun designed to shoot dissidents in the back of the head, not as a combat weapon, right? So if you're stuck with one of those, yeah, you might have to adapt to whatever you've got. But if you're carrying a reasonably made weapon here in the United States, you're not facing those constraints. It doesn't make sense. Keep things in their context. If you stick with the context, you'll always go well. Taking stuff out of that very limited, narrow context and trying to apply it, well, this must be the best for everything, everybody, ever. It's stupid. Well, and this isn't just restricted to... Uh, Empty, empty chamber. chamber. This is Israeli this is really stuff in com or in general. Exactly, but it's a good, good prototypical example of yeah. They they they're making do with a bad situation in many circumstances, and if you don't have the same bad situation, why why constrain yourself like that? Well, the the what is it? What's that little pup? Tabor. It's Israeli. It's got to be good. Not better than an M16. <laughs> oh well. Okay, next one. Oh, this one. This one is specifically for Haggard. Okay, you ready? And it goes something like this. This is my safety. That's your fucking trigger finger. <laughs> That uh, you know, I'm I'm told uh, by friends that know the guy that was responsible for that incident that to this day he regrets that shit and specifically regrets that it ever made it in the movie out of context. Um, I you know I greatly prefer you know you look at Pat Mac when he talked in this one video. Uh, it can never be in a, it's always an enabler, never a disabler. That's how that unit really does train. You know, other Chuck can talk to that, uh, to, you know, a much greater extent, but I think between that scene and Phil Singleton, uh, cops running around, uh, people running around the United States with safeties off of long guns, because this is my safety, uh, the, those, that, that that is two factors that we're still dealing with that we shouldn't have to be dealing with and if you look at how the true professionals are training you know <clears throat> you go down to, to rich mason's place and you know that's a guy with special forces background and what's he teaching if he's in the catwalk and he, he catches you with your carbine off safe inappropriately you're going to have a bad day you look at like Frank Proctor on his videos he's running the safety in between targets when he's scanning for targets you know, Pat McNamara, he's running his safety on his reloads. Uh, that's, a, that's how those guys are really trained. And you know why? They're so well trained. They know that even they are not exempt from the laws of phys physics and nature. We all have to deal with the laws of physics and nature. We're all subject to that shit. Nobody's so good. Nobody's so special that they're not. So what do you do? You train to a high standard so that you don't fuck that shit up. And it, it says that. something to the average Joe when the professionals 
you know, I, I don't put my safety on a carbine when I reload, but I understand why Pat Mack does, and I understand why he teaches it. And I also understand something else. He spent more time with one of those things in his hand in his career than I will spend in the entirety of my life. He has used it in all manner of circumstances and all manner of problems that I'll never even go near, thankfully. That's not my job. If he thinks that, there's value to consider. For me to go, if this man is this disciplined, if he's this well-trained, if he's this accomplished, and he thinks this is a good strategy, it's probably a good strategy because he's 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 been on the bleeding edge with men who live and die based on their TTPs. So it would be it would be foolhardy of me to go, oh, this is my safety, sir, when the guy from the unit that's the real deal that actually did the stuff we see about in movies no, he puts his safety on for every bloody thing that he does because when you're in, and Chuck talked about this last week in the, in the game show and talked about some stuff I'd never heard before about, you know, using the shotgun as a, as a breaching tool and how you have to pretty much treat it, you're cash, casting it to the side and they're wearing all this stuff on their chest and their back. And the number of accidents that they've had, even those guys, I mean, and we're not talking some rando at a public gun range. We're talking about people carefully selected for their ability to handle things under stress. If those guys are not too high speed and have that problem, I sure as hell ain't. You know, Paul Howe wrote a whole article on that and specifically mentioned both in that article and a conversation I had with him, a breaching gun accident where uh, one of his teammates ended up medically retired because you take a breaching slug through the uh, calf and, you know, you're done. That uh, there, You are never going to be whole after something like that. Uh, and, you know, it slings and gear and movement and everything else. You get the best trained guys in the world, and if they do it wrong, then it's still going to bite them in the ass. Right, yeah. and 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 – the, the way they do things is, it, this is the important part for people to get, it's written in blood. They're doing it because they have seen this fight people. They have seen it take members of teams out. They've seen it injure people that don't need to be injured, kill people that don't need to be killed, and that's why they do that. And, and this is something that always annoyed me, the concept of like big boy rules. We've all heard that, right? Every big boy I've ever trained with is an absolute attention to detail about muzzle direction, about safety practices, because they do a bunch of hairy stuff and they see people get killed and injured just training before they even get to the mission. And that's a huge loss for them. Just in training, they've seen the dangers that that presents. We're doing dangerous stuff. And any layer, if you can add a layer between you and a loud noise and a gunshot wound, that doesn't really impact your ability to actually fight, why the hell wouldn't you do it? I mean, you, you layer safety when you jump out of airplanes. You layer safety when you build airplanes. You layer safety in all kinds of other stuff. Why is it with guns that we have to pretend we're all running around on the ragged edge and we're not operator or some shit? Now, you're, refi you're referring to firearms, right? Firearms, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, I, Ian's probably passed out on the floor by now. Um, yeah, I, those guys take this stuff seriously and more seriously than I ever did when I even with training with them. I'm like, wow, reloading safety during a reload. Why the hell would I need to do that? But when I consider the experiences this guy has, there's a reason why he's saying that. And that reason is probably written in somebody's blood. This is the cognitive dissonance of that bullshit. People do the, this is my safety thing. And they run around with a safety off on a long gun. Why? Because they're worried they won't get it off or they won't get it off in time. They heard about somebody that forgot to take their safety off or they forgot to take their safety off or whatever. So they're not trained enough and they're not willing to train enough to unfuck themselves so that they can't uh, forget their safety so that uh, they achieve that level of automaticity in their training to where it just happens. But they think they're so well trained that this is my safety. Now, which is it, motherfucker? You can either run your gear or you can't. And if you can't not forget your safety is on and you need this whoopee of running around with your safety off, 
then this is not your safety. This is your booger hook. You know, that, 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 that is a level of cognitive dissonance that should make people's heads fucking explode. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so about, about that, the, uh, you know, the, the guys that have been on Modcast before, whatever, and heard the story about my last pistol shooting, it was a direct result of not being able to run my plate carrier reloads properly. And so because I couldn't get a fresh mag out of the bungee retention that it was in, in a timely manner, under the panic of being engaged with a machine gun, I went to my pistol because I had done more rifle to pistol transitions in that past 10 years than I'd probably done rifle reloads, honestly. Um, it's, it's very ironic that in that movie about the Battle of Mogadishu, they talk about this being my safety, but one of the rangers that was killed in the Battle of Mogadishu was killed attempting to defeat his safety because he had not practiced. He was an M60 gunner and was offered a Mag 58 and took it because it was more reliable. And at the moment of truth, when he was being engaged with an AK, he tried to deactivate the Mag 58 safety using his left thumb in a downward sweeping motion instead of his firing finger in a push-in motion like deactivating the safety on a shotgun. And he died, shot in the face, emptied his brain housing group into his 200-round ammo can of 7.62 NATO, attempting to get his weapon to go on fire. But that's the result of grabbing the new shit and not putting the reps in. And so your new shit is um, conscious, cognitive. You have to think about it. It's not unconscious, competent back here. And it's that transition time from uh, old to new that is the most dangerous as professionals, uh, especially if we think our have, we have our shit together. Uh, I will tell you, I saw one of the most crazy unsafe things that I've seen in a long time on a range. I was shooting with a group of individuals and I was not in charge. And, uh, I had, um, um, uh, I, I saw a bunch of guys with a bunch of different setups and I saw a cat that was running a, a, uh, six hour two, two, six in a safari land holster. And he was carrying it cocked and locked. Um, like, like I thought it was a, I thought it was a forgot to decock thing. Like put it in there, put the hood on it. And I'm like, you don't, uh, you don't run your gun decock. Nah, man, I'm good. Roger that. Um, and he was going for what he knew with that thing. You know what I'm saying? But that gun mechanically was not designed to be carried like that, but that's, but that's where he was at. You know what I mean? So sketchy shit out there. I got a question, um, and perhaps it was already mentioned or discussed. Um, in that scene of the movie, was he um, actually carrying cruiser carry at that point, and he was just being a smart ass about his finger being his safety? I was told I he had a magazine out and the hammer down. And so storage condition. He was yep. being harassed about his safety not being on. That's so what, I, safety, I knew I'd heard some. The safety doesn't go on exactly. when the hammer's down. So he'd safely cleared the weapon, and they were like, well, your safety's not on. Well, the hammer's down. But your safety's not on. The hammer's down. Um, and then the guy got frustrated with the retardery of that and then came up with the quip that's now famous. Out of Completely out of context, right? you know? <laughs> yep. Back. Okay, next one. This one is for Chad. Oh shit. <laughs> what do we got? ARs are like Legos. <laughs> Not well. nineteen thirteen rails. And their yeah. accoutrement are like Legos. <laughs> and those Lego interfaces happen to be on your gun that has extremely tight tolerances. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I wish all ARs were Legos. You know why? Because Legos are made to a standard. 
<laughs> but most of these people out there saying that the ARs were like Legos, they're actually playing with Duplo bo- blocks and bristle blocks. Nice. Maybe even some Lincoln logs. Oh, yeah, not, not Duplo. Because cool, you can't even, they couldn't even figure out how to do a catapult with the Lincoln logs. Yet. Hey, it works for them, bro. It yeah, works for them. Works, works for them, man. Agree you know, disagree. That, okay. Huge fan of the original Magnificent Seven, right? Whenever Yul Brenner and Stephen Queen meet, right, and they're standing by the by the uh, corral. I think it's that scene, anyways. Um, and he tells the the story about the guy that jumps out the window, and the people on the floor is below him. Every time he flew past the window, they hear him say, "So far, so good." And then you know, he wraps up saying, "So far, so good" about their adventure. But that's what these people are like. Yeah, they're plunged to their death, but you're like, "So far, so good, man." So far, so good. Hey, man, samurais didn't build their own swords, dude. Mm-hmm. Hey, I've heard that somewhere. Th- that, that was a good quote. Might dude. have. As, as a gunsmith? Might have been. Right. As, as a gunsmith and an experienced armor, um, if I were to, like, swear on, like, next week with a department... Of my rifles that I own, um, there's only one that I'd grab as a patrol rifle, and it's not because of how it's set up or anything. The main reason is because it is the only factory complete rifle that I've done nothing to the internal one. And I'm the manufacturer's armor instructor, right? Like I'm the guy that I should, you know, I'm like totally hands off the inside of the guts of that gun. Um, of course, if I swap parts, I have no qualms doing that. I'm only saying that to show that. If there's anybody else out there more qualified than me, I probably know them. Um, but factory complete gun, and I would do that for a uh, duty roll weapon. Not using hobby shop. Because parts ain't parts, folks. Parts ain't yeah, parts. That, that hey, went man, out t- with revolvers. So, um, in in the comment section, it has been brought up uh, by a grammar Nazi, and that that's an actual grammar Nazi, not a grammar uh, fiscally conservative libertarian. Uh, <laughs> that um, that uh, Lego is in fact the plural, a- as is samurai. We, we're adding S's on the shit that, that we're not supposed to be putting S's on. So th- thank you for the peanut gathering. <laughs> Fucking kidding. <laughs> it's also like a Danish word, so it's like we're putting American English rules on a Danish word. So I don't even know if that's possible. Well, though the plural of firearm is firearms, so yeah. 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 <laughs> so the plural of serpa would be serpas or serpa. No, because that's, that's next. A big pile of manure. There we go. <laughs> serpa. 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 Very nice. Serpa. Very nice. I just stepped in a big pile of serpa. Somebody so in chat. Next topic. Somebody in chat. What What do you put in a serpa? I just want to point out that somebody in chat said made the uh, made the comment that Jedi has built their own lightsabers. And I just want to point out that ninety nine percent of the Jedi were killed off by a bunch of clones with blasters. That's also true. And I will be seeing Star Wars in just a couple hours. And I refuse to say any spoilers after the fact. Yeah, maybe just pattern your life after what magic space wizards do. Yeah, Dramatic you got a pattern of your fry. pistols after like the inter- the interstellar like smugglers do with their guns. After you, pokey religions and ancient religions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, Serpa in general, they are the they are the absolute worst thing I think that is I have seen, and I'm, I'm they they vex me and heat me like the white whale to Ahab. Because they're so unbelievably bad. So I, I have, uh, and I saw this years ago. It's the video of Craig Douglas and Paul Gomez, and um, you know, there's doing some wrestling around on the ground, and a guy who has a serpa holster, a little pebble, gets under the uh, retention mechanism and locks the gun in there. Now it's it's a training gun, a T gun, so it's it's not a dangerous safety thing. And they work their damnedest to get the thing out and can't and end up ripping the holster 
clean off of its anchor points on the belt. Just whoosh, and Chuck can tell you that is not at all an uncommon occurrence because not only is it retarded and stupid to actually take our trigger finger and do this to try and release a weapon from its holster and people go, well, that's a training issue. Bullshit. This is what people actually do. I have seen hundreds of people on the range with these things. And when you put them under stress, they start jabbing at that thing like it's a, you know, a monkey punching at a button that's going to give them a banana. They do this. And then we're intelligent to tighten their hand against something, press inward hard, and rip. And what happens? That finger goes right to the trigger, bam, and it causes a problem, especially on a short travel trigger like a Glock. So you have the shittiest retention mechanism in the history of mankind combined with some of the shittiest workmanship you will find on any product that you could hope to bet your life on. And it, when it, it either holds the gun when it's not supposed to, or it rips completely off the freaking thing. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible holster. And every time I see somebody with one, I have the urge to just go up and grab the butt of the gun and rip it off and hand it to him and go, now go buy a real holster. Maybe Chuck's done that a time or two. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> not on the street, but in uh, in weapon retention class a number of times. I've lost track of how many of those holsters I've broken. They'll either separate from the mount uh, the, the belt loops, the paddle will break or the holster itself will rip open. Uh, they crack open pretty easily, uh, particularly the concealment version of it. Uh, on my agile page on Facebook, I've got pictures of broken Serpa holsters. Uh, people are like, well, that's never happened to me. It works for me. It's because they haven't pressure tested their gear. Um, I've got more time with those than almost anybody I know. Uh, I was actually using prototype Serpas before they hit the market. Uh, Black Hawk and Stratagos had a, uh, had a relationship there for a while. Um, we got a bunch of those things. I'll tell you what, I know people that were involved in the design of the holster and the marketing of the holster. I wanted it to be a good holster. I didn't come into this saying, oh, he's just a hater. I wanted it to be good. Uh, and we had very few options back then. It was thumb brakes. Uh, the SLS was brand new, and there was a problem with the SLS. I'll tell you where we saw it was when we did ground fight training, uh, particularly with the SWAT holsters. That SLS hood would pop open, and a dude would have a dummy gun or a sim gun on the deck, and then there would be a ground fight over a gun that was up for grabs. So the the circle wasn't prone to that um, retention malfunction, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, I gave it a good try, uh, almost three years of experience between multiple holster systems. Uh, it's just a piece of shit. It's poor materials. It's poorly designed. Uh, even if you disregard the trigger finger thing as a training issue, uh, it sticks, it jams. I was two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, something like that on night shift, uh, doing a building search. I had pulled my gun and, uh, I go to reholster and the little spring that powers the uh, retention mechanism on the Serpa had broken. And it's a zero retention gun bucket without that little spring. There's no way to inspect it. There's no way to repair it. There's no way to see when it's going to break, do any PMCS or anything like that. It spontaneously breaks and you have no warning. Uh, I had that happen to me three different times where that little spring broke. A Blackhawk will send you a brand new holster, uh, but that doesn't help me on night shift at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning when my shit just has a catastrophic failure. Uh, the guns being stuck in the holster, I've seen it with sand, I've seen it with pebbles, I've seen it with sticks, I've seen it with snow. You get snow in the holster and it's jammed and you can't get it out. Sometimes you can pound on it, beat it with a fist, break the gun loose. But I have had to destroy holsters one time at the range with a flat tip screwdriver. One time we had a pair, we, we were lucky enough to have a pair of tin snips handy. Uh, I've had to cut whole Serpa holsters off of guns multiple times. I've broken them in training. Uh, I wanted them to work, but it, you can't, I can't ignore empirical evidence and not just a few. I mean, hell, we had one of our detectives was wearing one 
you know, standard, like a lot of cop places where they, 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 they're not wearing the suit and tie. They got like the polo and the khakis. They were in a restaurant and he sits down in a chair and the butt of the gun catches the slat of the chair behind him and it breaks the holster off of his belt. Uh, one of the pictures on my Agile Facebook page, the guy broke his holster getting out of the car. He was getting out of the fucking car and his holster uh, broke. Yeah, you know, uh, it works for me. Uh, no, it doesn't. You just don't know it yet. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but a surfaces are cheap, right? They they are probably one of the most heavily profit margin holsters you can sell, which is why gun stores sell them. They're selling them for what forty or fifty bucks. They're paying maybe fifteen for them, so it's a good margin error. But they are also a product of a lack of confidence in your skill. Because if I if I want to have a retention holster, you will find it all the time because, you know, Chuck, you have experience with the older style Safari Land that you had to do the little uh, little doohickey on the side and then you had to twist it a certain way and then get it out, right? Those kind of old style retention holsters. People, A, were not practicing with these holsters and so they were not confident in their ability to get the gun out. And there were probably many occasions where they just didn't succeed in getting the gun out because they hadn't trained it. And here's a Serpa and people are going, oh, well, it's, it's easier for me to draw my gun this way. Instead of doing the work, instead of training with good gear, they look for a gigaw and a doodad that will solve their lack of training problem. And it produces the dumbest fucking holster in the history of mankind. You know, I'll tell you, uh, I worked with mine for, you know, all, pushing three years. And I still had a failure rate on my draws where you start to draw the gun before you get the retention latch completely undone and the gun will stick. And that's where the trigger figure thing you were talking about happens. That happened to me a lot. And I had tens of thousands of draws and I would still regularly fuck it up. Um, I've seen video multiple times. Todd Jarrett, Todd Jarrett is paid He's a paid professional shooter working for Black Hawk. I've seen multiple videos of him fucking up the draw and sticking it, flubbing the draw. If it's going to happen to Todd Jarrett, it's going to happen to you. So it appears like it's got a, a really easy, intuitive draw, and it doesn't. It doesn't hold up under pressure. So that's another failure of that. Uh, you know, my, my personal opinion, what I've noticed uh, under duress, you talk about how your options shrink. We know about Hicks Law, things like that. Uh, I find people can do this thing or that thing. If, they, if they've got branching, this choice or that choice, uh, if you start adding third and fourth choices, that's a problem. How many of us in this panel, being experienced shooters, never fuck up a trigger pull? We have to work on our trigger pull a lot. It is the toughest thing to learn correctly, and it is, in my opinion, like with pistols, the most perishable skill we have. Now, I'm going to take that trigger finger, and i got to build up all this muscle memory with this thing, and I'm going to add a task under duress to that trigger finger. Well, what, what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah, your trigger I, fingers got your trigger fingers got two jobs: pull the trigger or park out of the way and don't pull the trigger. That's the two things you should be doing. You shouldn't be adding tertiary duties to that thing. Yeah, um, you know when you when you start getting into probability versus possibility and and what are the chances of it happening? I mean, at some point you're going to get into diminishing returns. Uh, and um, so, like, for me, but Chuck just brought up a great point. Perishable skill, uh, trigger pull as, as, it, as it applies to recoil anticipation flinch. When I run a Bianchi plate rack, my front sight post, it rests in the upper one-third of the plate. So in the event that I fuck up my trigger pull and or my grip, my grip is loose, I can maybe recover that plate by shanking the round low and having it still hit the plate instead of any one of the 10 gazillion fucking ricochets that people have seen hit the bar and go, bam, 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 bam. If you're going to miss a Bianchi rack, you're going to miss low. So guess what? I aim high. 
If I, if my aim is true, I knock the plate down. If I fuck it up, I might still knock the plate down. I am hedging my bets that I'm going to suck at the moment of truth. That's why people wear ALS holsters with leg straps, because they don't want their UBL to give them the fucking wingy, wingy, wingy off the side of their hip when they dick their fucking draw up. It's going to happen eventually. Um, so, But there are equipment ways to get around that. And guess who's not hating on Blackhawk? I'm not hating on Blackhawk because it's not their fault that the Sherpa is popular. It's every other holster manufacturer's fault that the Sherpa has been out for over a fucking decade and we don't have a concealment holster with level two retention that is legitimate for polo wearing detective detecting shit. So we need an alternate to the SLS ALS duty grade 645321DO fucking Safari Land holster. There can't, there got there has to be something between Serpa and multicam wrapped fucking goodness from Bahala. Build a <laughs> holster right in here and everybody will buy the motherfucker. I don't know why that's so goddamn hard. <laughs> I gotta I gotta read this quote. This is from where'd it go? Crusader Arms Channel. I really like what he just said about this. Where the hell did it go? Now I need to... Okay. Just like everyone does millions of repetitions of chewing each day, they still manage to bite the inside of their mouth on occasion. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, how, how about this? It's like, you know, going back to that Serpa, there's probably one of those 40 cow Glocks in there in the Serpa. And it's like, well, the police use them both, so they must be good to go. You know, good for them, good for me, right? The the biggest the the biggest seller for that, and it's just like the Beretta, the M9. It's DOD. And it's the fact that the Marine Corps and others have been using the Serpa for so long. You got hundreds of thousands, well, not that many, tens of thousands who actually carried pistols who get out, and that was their issue holster. It's good enough for for them to be issued. It's good enough for them to carry on the street because it's been proven to them, right? And so they buy it. And that's hard to sell against. It's very hard to sell against because now, you know, I'm saying that my beloved Marine Corps is wrong because I've been issuing the Ser Serpa for so long. And we the mentioned better. Yeah, we mentioned this before the podcast. That's another context thing, right? So carrying a Beretta 92 with that long double action, heavy double action trigger pull in a Serpa holster is a different thing than carrying a Glock with that somebody has zebbed or done whatever other violence they've done to the inside of that bloody thing to give it that super light trigger pull with a short pull trigger. You have a pretty wide margin of error with that Beretta 92 that you do not have when you're using, say, a 1911 or a Glock. You know, with these short trigger pull striker fire dealies, you know, that everybody wants to get trigger jobs on because everybody wants to shoot fast, sir. You know, you have to take into context that, that the, the Beretta gives you the margin of error you won't have with the other guns. And they, well, it worked for me in the military in a completely different context with a completely different weapon with completely different things you have to worry about on that weapon. Yep. And, and going back to what Chuck said at the beginning about Glocks, it is possible for everybody to be right in a, in a context type situation. Uh, Chuck can see broken Glock after broken Glock after broken Glock or malfunctioning Glock 22s. And then uh, another agency can have 10,000 that shoot flawlessly because it's already been determined that it's the pressure load of the duty ammo combined with the light that's causing the rail flex that's causing this Glock 22 phenomenon. So just because you're taking my uh, empirical word that I never saw a fucking problem with Glock 22s and flashlights, that's because I was using a, a, a fucking duty round and only one fucking duty round. Not send a motherfucker off to shooting school and he goes and buys 500 rounds of whatever. The only ammo to ever fire through that gun was the ammo that was tested when the gun was fielded with that flashlight. That is a known quantity. So you can't take that sampling of Glock 22s and throw them into a conversation about Glock 22s and flashlights not working worth the fuck. Because it's all about the context. 
Yep. It's like, why aren't stock cars stock? <laughs> it, 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 it's the same. It's the same principle. I mean, you know, he's got like a whole pro. You know, he's got the pro shack over there with all these gunsmiths. They can tweak stuff. Like they put together empirical data because they actually do testing and stuff. Um, but for people to say what well, works for them, what well, works for them because they have the support structure to make sure it works for them. Hey, right. how, how about this? How many has Marine Force Recon and Delta Force sold? Well, like they're used guns? You know, like, oh, just yeah. because they're using them. Yeah, because they use them. Like, I don't know if any of those organizations have received a check from the 1911 syndicate for <laughs> oh, doing I, all that I, sales for them. i tell you what, they sold a shitload of Kimbers whenever Jet One picked up the Kimber. They sold yeah, a shitload yeah. of Kimber. And then when LA, LAPD <laughs> picked up the Kimber. Yeah. And then immediately pissed yeah. off a lot of Kimber owners because their guns sucked. <laughs> they, could, they could do 100 guns. Okay, ready for the next topic? This one is especially good for Mr. Pressburg. And it goes something like this. Basically, the concept is the expectation that the bad guy is going to go down in one or two hits. <laughs> only if you use a 12 gauge. <laughs> if, you don't want, if you only want to kill him a little bit, what? Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know where to go with that. <laughs> it's so stupid, it's hard to, it's hard to answer. I, I, but it know, comes I, up so frequently. Well, it has to be a forty-five or a thirty caliber class. Yep. The the big deal um, that I'm learning now that I'm teaching as an instructor is how much and and perhaps this is the one time where I'm going to beat up on the on the competition community. Um, it's one thing for me to put out a drill and you want to be first or you want to win or whatever. But when I put out a drill with very easily definable no shoots, and then I tell you if you fucking shoot the white Ipsic target right now on this drill, you owe the class a 12 pack of beer. And in one drill, I get eight and a half cases of fucking beer. Um, that shows me that there are people that never learned that uh, you can't miss fast enough. There are people that don't understand a no fail shot. And, and that is the fundamental of all fucking marksmanship. When you, like, go to that fucking movie, Act of Valor, with the fucking dude in the goddamn basement with the Mexicans and his fucking thumb shot off and shit. He has one shot to fucking make this shit fucking work. That is a no-fail shoot. And so in the midst of all these other things that you do with firearms, you have got to be able to go into your zen matrix fucking space and na 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 boom on demand you must be able to hit when i fucking tell you to if you cannot do that with a firearm you are not going to win a fucking gunfight and and so these gunfights normally start out as just just fucking accurate enough just accurate enough just accurate enough and there's a lot of hits, a lot of hits, a lot of hits, and nobody's fucking dying. And then somebody decides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut a light switch off in this motherfucker. And they stop shooting at a cadence of 0 .25, 0 .25, 0 .25, 0 .25. And they get out of .45 and shoot that dude right through the bridge of the fucking nose and end it. And our shooters out there in the entire community, civilian, cops, whomever, they cannot detach their own fucking natural self-preservation with the cadence of their fucking firearms discharge. So if you want to be a one or two shots will stop this fight, you had better get into a, a zen-like state of rounds fucking going through your shit, through your clothes, through your body, and totally detaching yourself from that reality and turning your entire world into your front sight post. Because if you can't do that, you ain't winning the fucking fight. Sorry. Sorry, you ain't winning the fucking fight. Unless it's dumb fucking luck. Broken ass watches right twice a day. Congratulations. He bled to death faster than you did. You win. Uh, we, we talked a, bit, a little bit about this in the shotgun uh, shotgun episode last week. Where you, if you watch dash cam video enough, right, 
you, you will see almost invariably a burst of fire out of our good guy in response that is really not a whole lot of consciousness going on to it. It's the pure reptilian, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And then at some point there's a there's a settling. You see this especially with carbines. You'll see dudes that'll go through ten rounds just whack, 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 whack. and then they go, oh shit, I'm running out of ammo. I have to aim now. Right? So that that's a natural phenomenon. It is a perfectly natural phenomenon to be scared and to go make the bad man go away. But yeah. it's not terribly and it takes a crap load of training to get someone who can operate efficiently and do what needs to be done even when that's going on. Oh, right? And I, I'm telling you, I, I don't think I level don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, to say that a cop's just gonna default to self preservation and just make the bad man go away. I think that I think what we're seeing, another way I think you might be misattributing that, what you're seeing. Um, we tend to default to our level of training. There was a time whenever you'd see a whole lot of pairs being being fired off. Um, and if you're seeing now, I'm not saying I'm seeing it or whatever. I haven't made that correlation. Um, but if you're noticing that, I would be more inclined to see them defaulting to their level of training. And I would be pointing and say, hey, these guys are pushing NSRs like crazy. When in doubt, get an NSR out. Um, and then they hit that cadence of fire where they're like, oh, yeah, front sight or clear front sight. Um, but, yeah, it's – I would see it as a testament to their training. Um, or, unless it's a, oh, shit, homie hop, and then get right. back behind cover, you know, chin weld, all this other stuff. Got it. But, I mean, if they're getting on it and they're giving them the gas, then I wouldn't say that they're just firing because they're scared. I think oh, they're, they're doing what they pra- – they, they've rehearsed for that dance. Absolutely. There, there's there's a difference between someone who's firing in hope and someone who's firing in expectation, right? The guy who's put in the reps, the guy who's done the training, he can fire at a 0.25 or a 0.20 cadence and hit what he's aiming at. Uh, most people ain't batting in that league. I mean, I, I can't reliably put, even at fairly close range, if I'm at seven yards, keeping all my rounds in an eight-inch circle under best conditions, I might can do you know a 0.20 split like that. I'm not going to be trying to shoot that kind of split in a real fight, I'm going to be slowing down dramatically to try and get the hits that I need to get. That I need to get. So the very well practiced, the very well disciplined, very well trained shooter, they can accomplish things at those kind of speeds. The problem is most of them aren't batting at that league, and they try and go at that speed anyway. Or, or, or they they have uh, like Tom Gibbons talks about it in his classes, the, the concept of pacing. We mentioned that in the shotgun episode last week too. They, they are shooting at the three-yard pace at 15 yards, and they're not getting any hits, right? They don't, they don't have a switch in their head that recognizes this is the circumstances that are being dictated. This shot has to fit the circumstances. I need to take more time to work the trigger and the sights to get that hit. I can't use my three-yard shooting program at 15 yards and be successful. But a lot of people, all they've got, is that three yard shooting program and you get that from them no matter what. And that's, that really is put gun in front of face, yank trigger till bad man stops as opposed to the disciplined person who will do what Chuck says and drop that rate of fire and make those shots. Man, he freezes at the best time. Awesome. Um, <laughs> He's going down to make sure he hit. <laughs> right. I like it. Make sure he make sure he hits his point. He nailed it. Um, Throttle no, control. Hey, you'll see. You guys will see that with self diagnosis of shooters. When a shooter sucks because they haven't fucking practiced, and I'm talking about all of us on this board, the first thing that we lose is our accuracy. We're not going to go out there and shoot our El Presidente slower. We're just going to throw our rounds all over the fucking <laughs> board. And then it's our like, God damn, where'd that D come from? Oh yeah, I haven't shot in four months. My bad. Let me slow down. And so. It is the self-realization in real time of your sights telling a story about how your finished product is going to look. But it, in real time, I want you to realize it when your fucking sights are doing hanky shit two or three rounds into the El Prez, not when you walk 10 yards forward and go, wow, where'd that D come from? I must have blacked out. I don't remember that. Like, that's he, he shot him mid-homie hop. He caught him in the hip as he jumped. 
that that's that's where that's where fucking badasses live. We let la- we live in the fucking whoa. I'm shooting way too fast right now, <laughs> and you end up with two C's at the beginning because you're like I'm I'm off the fucking charts right now. I am holding this gun like a little bitch. My sights are going all over the fucking place. They're not settled again. I'm jerking the shit out of this trigger because I want to shoot six seconds because the last time I did this shit six months ago and I haven't done it since, it was six goddamn seconds. So we're going to shoot this bitch in six seconds. Hold on. Watch watch this shit. And, uh, and, <laughs> and dudes do that at my shooting class, whether that be peer pressure or them just fucking with themselves. I don't care. Like, I didn't even put a time drill on this fucking standard. All I said was, don't shoot the fucking white target. Nope. <laughs> Fuck no. Fuck, watch this shit. Pow! Pow! Pow, 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 pow! Fucking... I mean... <laughs> Where did this backup gun come from? I didn't even ask for a second pistol. You know, like... They can't fucking smoke hostages fast enough, man. Fucking... Well, you know what they say, after you shoot the first one, the rest are just witnesses. <laughs> the rest of them are just additional 12 packs. Fuck. <laughs> I wish I had come up with this shit when I was still drinking. <laughs> save, me out, save my ass a lot of money. <laughs> Finance my fucking alcoholism. Non-target discriminating triggers jerking motherfuckers, man. Calm the fuck down and slow down. Damn. Okay, Chuck. Got another one for you. And this is along the exact same lines. You won't see your sights in a gunfight. You won't see your sights in a gun. <laughs> I, I hate to answer that in a Ron Burgundy, but <laughs> if you're saying that, you, you are 100% honest with yourself. Thank you for the self actualization um, you, you, you won't see your sights in that gunfight, and you might actually win it. Um, hey, man, shit happens. Got to get them out there. Dude, there are officers killed every year on the serious tip. There, there, there are uh, peace officers, first responders killed every year by not committed, tweaked out Iraqi veterans on five types of fucking booze and and uh, and, and uh, benzos. All right, they're killed by dudes that have literally grown up in an urban environment where they were never even able to go out to a trash dump in a rural area and fire the stolen Glock that they bought or traded in exchange for narcotics. And uh, the first rounds that are ever discharged out of that Glock are fatal wounds to an officer that has spent his entire career uh, to live up to that point. And uh, that officer does not come out of that fight um, successful. Uh, how, how do we attribute that? Because of physics, man. I, once the bullet leaves the barrel on, on an arc or trajectory, it, it's going to go out there somewhere, and if you happen to be in the path of it, it is going to strike your body, and then once it gets into the terminal ballistics phase, if it ruptures something bad enough, an ER doctor, a surgeon standing next to you with a fucking table is not going to be able to save your life. And that happens. So, if you aren't fucking aiming, you might still kill people and win gunfights. Fucking Pookie does it all the time. But but that's not that's not the proper course of action. Like, you know, that that's like putting a fucking suction cup Jesus on your dashboard and just letting him drive. Just get in the passenger seat. Jesus, you drive. And, and let Wait a minute. Jesus is the co-pilot. Jesus. Yeah. Just, let suction cup Jesus run this motherfucker. Like, you ain't even going to steer. Uh, no, you need to take charge of your shit. Like like, uh, like, like my man Haggard said, um, you know, fortune favors the bold. Luck is what you make it. Fucking all that shit. It all, it all applies. So, yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't look at your sights. It's fine. Yeah, the other guy can be lucky. Hey, man, it's Jesus. Good. You know, the the dynamics of what uh, other Chuck was just talking about, though, uh, it, typically when Pookie, because there's a lot, I, I've, I've lost track. I've worked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of street shootings where people had a bullet in the toe or through the calf. Uh, 
walking around. I've, I've lost track of how many times I walk up, I talk to some dude, he's holding a rag on his head. What happened? Dude shot me. Um, so the, the successful, like as in shutting somebody down with a handgun, street shootings that you see are very, very rare, actually, uh, where you see the officer uh, killed some of these things like that. Typically, they ignored some sort of pre-attack indicator, and dude had a shot on them uh, from like two to three feet away. Well, if I can use a Makita drill technique to put a <laughs> muzzle on you from right. a near, near point blank, you know, near contact range, uh, anybody can shoot a handgun at those distances. That's how those guys are successful. It has nothing to do with marksmanship. It has to do with initiative deficit on the part of the officer, poor tactics, and them not reading the situation. Uh, and then when we think about what do you have to do to fight your way out of that hole, one of the things you better be able to do is be able to get effective hits quickly. Um, when you guys were talking about the cadence of fire and things like that, Go back, start watching some of these events like uh, <clears throat> cops are trying to set up a felony car stop and a dude jumps out and starts shooting and then a bunch of cops start shooting back. You'll always see these dudes. You'll see bullets skipping off the pavement all around that cat, sometimes hundreds of them before the guy goes down. That That's not acceptable shit. Uh, that's people honking on the trigger, getting excited, target focus, uh, and we know we can watch it right there on the video. That shit doesn't work. Uh, so yeah, using your site, definitely what, what you need to be doing. Back when was that one from Atlantic city. Yeah. I was thinking about that very one. On a street full of people, there's all these stray rounds going all over the place. People are running for their lives as they're trying to shoot this one dude three or four officers, and it just, it was a complete shit show. Well, bullets yeah, don't take up a whole lot of space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, windows are bigger targets than people. Like, right. you know, we did that podcast with Jared Reston, and, uh, and yeah. Chuck and I and a few others were on here, and we were asking him questions after he told his story. And, and, and Chuck can correct me if I'm off of my numbers here, but as he's filling this dude in, he's tracking his sights, you know, fighting from the pine, we're out of position and he's filling the dude in talking about like shooting a kid with a water gun. Right. He's filling him in and uh, hit him several times, like several times, like seven times, I think in the torso. And he didn't end the fight until he got him in a headlock and he screwed it in his ear and it let the gun feed. Um, he guaranteed that shot. Uh, of the torso hits, he was hitting them in timers. Those were all timers, right? Um, at some point, it was it wasn't snake brain. At some point, he made the cognitive decision that he's got to end this now, and he and he went for that shot um, for the brain. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of variables going on. Whole lot of variables, and you don't know like. When you talk about like people like shooting people a whole bunch, and I haven't shot people a whole bunch, I say that wholeheartedly and 100% honest. I shot people a whole bunch, um, but when you see it happen time and time again in the sterility of video, it, it you know everybody come everybody's like a, a football expert during football season. Everybody's a baseball expert during baseball season. It's really easy to watch from the stands and know how, how it works in the field. But the best hitters in baseball. They're the ones that can read the seams on the pitch. They're the ones that can see the front. Um, everybody else is just flailing at the ball. They're not getting the hits. That's just the point I'm making there. But. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I see videos, you know, we, we've all heard uh, of the situation that, you know, disproves the law or the rule. Um, you know, officers killed with 22s, fucking shit like that. The one that really fucked me up was there was a, officer that shot at a fleeing um, suspect and in his defense or in defense of the officer involved shooting, not the officer, uh, in defense of the, the officer involved shooting and its justification, they showed another video of an officer chasing a suspect and the guy did like a blind shot over the shoulder during the foot chase 
and killed that cop dead, man. And like, that's not how any of this is supposed to work. When you're chasing a dude and he decides, I don't want to run, I want to fight now, you're supposed to be able to visually see that or read the terrain that he has gone out of your sight and is potentially waiting to, to, to bushwhack you around the next corner of the house or the fence or whatever you got going on in the backyard in the dark and scary. It's not supposed to be, I'm in total sight of the suspect the entire time. I'm 15 feet fucking behind him, running at a full fucking sprint. Bam! And my lights are out. That's not how any of us uh, uh, th that carry guns for a living think that that, that shit is going to happen. Um, but that is what I'm talking about, the random physics of external and terminal ballistics. It, it, irrespective of tactics or marksmanship skill or anything else. That was just a bullet in flight that found its mark on an officer. And there was nothing that cop could have done uh, to prevent that, man. Um, and, and that, that seeing that video, uh, you know, it bothered me. It really, it, it, it really did bother me. Um, it, it probably sucked as bad as driving down the road and having your, your Humvee blow up under you, you know, like I didn't appreciate that shit, you know? Um, and it was one of those, whether I live or die is not in my hands right now kind of situations. You can't not chase the fucking fleeing felon. It's your job. It's what she swore an oath to do. But, uh, you know, random-ass bullets come out of high points all, all the time. The world's a fucking dangerous place. Yep. Well, a good, a good example of, you know, you only need to shoot somebody once. The, the best example, look at the freaking Miami firefight. Not needing your sights, you only need to shoot somebody once. Somebody who makes the determination that they're going to fight, it's going to take a lot more than pistol bullets to convince them not to. And, you know... If, if you don't believe that you don't need to use your sights because I'm close, you know, Gordon McNeil was like across a car hood from two violent felons who were going to go on to kill two FBI agents. They were going to maim him. We we're going to maim Morales. And it was going to be a horrible crap show. He had the best chance at that moment of stopping the fight. And he did what he'd been trained to do because you don't need to aim up close. And he didn't. And he failed with the six, only six shots he'd get in that fight. He was unable to take him out of the fight because, you know, that's what he'd been trained to do. And if you don't train yourself to have the discipline Chuck was talking about earlier, and you're relying on these little pea shooters we've got that we're carrying around, because if you're carrying a pistol, that's, it's, it's a pop gun. It doesn't do a whole lot uh, unless you put the bullets in a very, very precise location. It, people are thinking about it in terms of, well, if I was shot, I, I would stop what I'm doing. But you're not talking about yourself in a full flight. Or, you, you may not even realize you've been shot. I mean, all you guys have had experience you, who, who do this thing for a living. You've had experience with dudes who've been seriously wounded or even mortally wounded, but they've kept on fighting, not even acknowledging that they've been hit, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't count on it one round getting the job done, especially not with a handgun. They just don't do that. Like, uh, like, uh, it's like, like, look at, look at kids playing kids dodgeball, dodgeball. And, and it would be considered unfair and sportingly, like the kid's a cheat or a dirtbag, if you were to take one right in the chest, right in the numbers, and act like it never hit him at plan. All the good kids, they raise their hand, I'm out, and they walk off the court. And what we're talking about here, the dirty aspect, not taking yourself out of the fight, never allowing yourself to take yourself out of the fight. And that's where that's how you see people that get hit, um, in like in mass shootings that will get hit. They could probably mechanically walk at least to cover, but they get hit. They take themselves out and they lay down and, and wait for somebody else to expose themselves to the danger to come save them. Um, they've never prepared mentally for it. Um, but yeah, size of the dog of the fight, I guess, right. Yeah, I mean, we talk about this every time we talk about ballistics mm -hmm. class. Uh, yeah. Deer don't know that they're dying. That's how a dude that's got its heart shot out can be found 200 yards down a trailing fucking pile of blood until they finally exsanguinate. Because the, the deer are too dumb to know deer have been shot. They just know something's wrong. Indicator lights are going off. Run, run, run. Uh, human beings realize they get filled in. Uh you know, I mean, they didn't even have Sims when I was in high school and just watching those fucking officer 
uh, defensive tactics VHS tapes dad used to bring home with 38 caliber blanks and seeing the officer go, get, get, oh shit, you got me, got the clipboard, got the flashlight, one comes out the window, pack, cap gun goes off, officer falls the fuck down on the ground. What the fuck are you doing? That's cops and robbers since that kid was fucking born. That is, that is <laughs> fucking environmental impregnation into that fucking person's brain that if somebody gets the drop on you, oh, well, they won this round. That's not what wins gunfights, though. And that shit is fucking dangerous and deadly. And the Florida conversation is really fucking awesome in that it shows two individuals that sustain fatal gunshot wounds almost immediately. One of them, good for the cops, the one with the fucking assault rifle, he, uh, he cashed out fucking almost immediately, did almost no damage. All the heavy lifting in that gunfight was done by the other cat. They were both fucked up bad. One stayed in the fight and wasn't going to go out like a punk bitch, and the other one sat in the passenger seat and just kind of bled out like I see most people do when I shoot them. They just kind of like, ah, they, <laughs> ah, they just fade it out. You know, Audie Murphy fucking comes in all fucking shapes and sizes, man. And, and you know, you're going to end up – Jared ended up fucking rolling around with one in the back of a fucking strip mall. Like, that dude was not going out like a punk bitch. Um he had to be forced into the fucking light, and that's a that's a fucking fact, guys. That shit happens. Hey, Hager, here's one for you. Small caliber bullets just bounce around and cause damage. Fake news. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that uh, that like. 22s are more deadly because they bounce around. That's not how any of this works. That's not, you know, it's not a pool table. It's not a rubber ball. Uh, bullets can redirect uh, if they hit a sufficient barrier, but they do not ping pong back and forth through people. That's not how any of this shit works. Uh, anybody who thinks otherwise is a fuckwit. Um, you yeah, stop repeating that shit. And five, five, six bone traces. That's a popular one in the military. Is that five, five, six will bone trace? It'll hit you in the shoulder and come out your foot. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost the physics of the law. <laughs> but, which, hey, I'm not saying it hasn't happened. Well, Jer again, Jared, bullets do crazy shit when they hit me. Like, okay, I'm thinking one last one, and then we can call. We'll call it a night. Oh man, I just got warm. <laughs> Knockdown power or muzzle energy? <clears throat> yeah, it, it goes back to just just what we were discussing. Uh, it, it's sort of like that joke. You know, you read the book, I read the book. Has the bear read the book? Right. I'm using this much muzzle energy. That, that's supposed to knock this guy down. Well, if, if he didn't subscribe to that memo, he may not give a damn, especially if we're talking in terms of, of, of pistols. They just don't deliver the kind of damage people think they They see movies. They see a guy get shot with Dirty Harry's 44 Magnum, and he flies out through a window. It doesn't work like that. If, if it worked like that, the gun would have to move as much as the bad guy's moving when it goes off. Physics, once again, be a harsh mistress. She doesn't take a day off, right? Your your pistol does not do that kind of damage. I know, you know, guys believe that if you shoot a 45, the bullet will go back in time and eliminate the dude's ancestors, completely wiping him from the face of humanity for all. But all it does is it pokes little holes in things. Rifle bullets tear holes and tear stuff because they're supersonic and they punch holes in things. And shotguns, if you're using buckshot, they macerate tissue. That's the closest thing you get to real knockdown power, like Chuck, Chuck was talking about in, in last week's episode. It, it just doesn't work like that. Unless you hit the central nervous system and, you know, cut the lights out, yep. you expect them to continue doing whatever the hell they were doing before you started hitting them with the handgun until you put five or six rounds for them to realize, oh, bad things are happening. This kind of hurts. I should quit now. You know, to illustrate on that, Tom Gibbons had a demonstration. He used a 45 to show Newton's laws of physics. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And Tom would load a 45 with 
a single round, which I've done in classes after seeing that because it's a pretty cool demo. You put your thumb against the back of the slide. Yep. You press the trigger. Your thumb's not broken. It still works. You take your thumb off the back of the slide. You rack the slide, and a spent case comes out. Holy shit. How's that going to knock somebody down? Right. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the first police shooting that I was any kind of party to uh, with a handgun was a failure to stop. Uh, one of our narcs shot a dude through the sternum, through the aorta with a 45. And this guy was on his feet for probably the next four, four and a half minutes. Uh, he was not impressed with the cartridge. Uh, the, that it, you should expect that type of thing and have a plan to deal with it. Uh, you know, a lot of times we were talking earlier, other Chuck was talking, people fold up because they're conditioned or maybe they don't want to get shot anymore. But worst case scenario is they're completely unimpressed with your cartridge and you're going to have to have a plan B to follow up on. That is the norm. Uh, the, the service pistols all make about the same hole, 945, 40, 38 special. If the coroner or the surgeon doesn't find the bullet, they won't be able to tell you which of those calibers made the hole because the hole is ex pretty much exactly the same. Trained doctors in lab or, or autopsy or surgical conditions can't tell you which bullet made that hole. Uh, it is common for them to fail or for you need to follow up. So, yeah, they're, especially with handguns, no such, such thing as, for, as stopping power. It, it just doesn't work that way. Awesome. Well, I don't know about you guys. I like this. I think we should continue this kind of thing maybe every couple months, gather up a whole list. I still have several more. If you, if any of you guys want to stay on, we can do it for uh, the post show, the, the after party. I'm good. I think Chad will like. Yeah. Now, I do have to go see Star Wars, though, in, in an hour or so. So. Well, you're the one that, that set up Modcast on Star Wars night. I want to <laughs> take that for the record. <laughs> it's true. It's idea. true. Well, you know, that's why that's why Fisher's not allowed to be on, because he's going to spoil it all. Right. He'll tell everyone. Like, oh, damn, Modcast. He's just making shit up. F Fisher's spoiler alerts are like fucking Pookie shooting blindly over his shoulder, like, oh, shit, <laughs> Luke he's Skywalker. Like, well, fuck yeah, flip a fucking coin. He's either going <laughs> to die or he's not, motherfucker. You know what I mean? That, yeah, Fish is He's fucking, two for two. Yeah. He's throwing yeah. shit up on the wall just to see what sticks. Fuck him. Yeah, he's all in Chala. It's not like George Lucas calls him up. You know, he does. He opens, in, in his pile of optics and free guns and shits he gets, he gets his, like his yep. cliff notes from George Lucas on the next movie. So he can just like tease everybody with it, right? So let's see here. Let's go down the line for a quick final little whatevers. Chad, what do you have? What do I have? Yeah. Um, I don't have a big dick. Okay. <laughs> GMI. GMI. Is, is, is this the drugs <laughs> talking again? It's all, all downhill from here. No, man. We got a couple weeks left for 2017. Pretty awesome. I'm um, thinking I'm closing out the year this weekend with the last course that I'm working with a handgun class. Um, the Perrin holster started out not too impressed with it. Um, but the last class before Thanksgiving... I ended up needing to give it out as a loaner holster to a 13 year old girl who was left handed. I was able to actually get it, everything reversed for left handed carry. And uh, it worked great for her. And uh, she actually did really, really well. Um, and so that, that holster is on me. And I plan on having another one. And I'm not going to mess with the belt loops anymore. One left, one right. Um, but as far as anything else new, I've been putting a lot of time into CAD. I've got quite a few things designed. Yep. I'm just trying to get things polished for production at this point. Cool. But, yeah, I hope everybody has a safe and wonderful holiday next week. 
And um, yeah, hope I don't go out like a punk bitch at some point. <laughs> That's about it. I think we're all hoping that you don't. <laughs> right. Yeah. Legendary lawman <laughs> Chuck Haggard. Um. I, I wish I had some kind of words of wisdom, but um, I really don't have anything to, you know. You, you've already had a, a lot of quotable quotes. You know, phys, physics is the law and purpose suck. And I, I guess get some, get some training. What was it? Yeah, that, that's, oh, what was it that Craig Douglas would call you? Was it Marshall Haggard? Legendary. Yeah, it's the, the whole thing is legendary lawman Marshall Chuck Haggard. Um, he came up with Marshall because I'm in Kansas, and anyway, it it's a long story. Him and William April came up with that when he was on uh, with Varg. That was that was a cool show. I imagine you should have been there. Oh yeah, and they they uh, they got along nicely. It was they kind of didn't feed each other, but they were definitely in the same corner, which was cool. Hey, Don, we, we had that. Yeah. Did you hear about that nationwide crime syndicate that was based out of Kansas? No, you didn't. You're welcome. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chuck Haggard. Thank you for your service. And then we have Chuck Pressburg. What do you have? Um, I am, uh, going back to brag and doing a, uh, master gunner thing with the division master gunner going to do a night fighter, uh, deal for first brigade. So going to be pretty excited. I was in first brigade, uh, first battalion 20 years ago. Um, and so just trying to give it back. And then after that, you know, get prepping for shot show and, and, and all of that stuff. So classes are coming in 18 open enrollment classes are coming. If you're interested in hosting one in your area. Uh, you know, I got plenty of time on the calendar. I think you can fill a class and you want a, a pistol, a rifle, a nods, whatever. Um, you know, the times times are out there. So 2018 is going to be a lot more training, a lot more Fisher on the road type of stuff and less kind of uh, focused on behind the scenes industry consulting stuff. So it's going to be more just out there with the student base, if, if you will. Cool. And then we have Jack, Jack Lewis. I'm, I'm just going to continue to try to not get killed in the streets <laughs> while also being constantly paranoid of what will or will not get me killed in the streets. And do you have any uh, all I can do. anything to plug? Websites, Instagram things, sponsors? Man, there's this Ambrosia Terrebone guy. And he's a, he's a silly little dude. He's, he's a good friend of mine. So I can check him out if you, if you got the time. He's the only one out there. He's your boy, AT, Ambrosia Terrebone. He's your boy. Mike Lewis. Uh, pretty excited going into 18. Um, just just finalized uh, first class of the year. It's going to be my first class coming back out of the gates. Pretty excited for that. Going to be working with the unit on Fort Bragg in February, trying to get their guys more proficient and improve their lethality with carbines. Uh, going to be following up with that, coming up with a schedule. I'll, I'm kind of tied to the local area, so North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia will be doing some, some, some stuff around here. Good stuff. And you're – not it's your target. It's your 25-meter cheater. The cheater, yes. Um, <laughs> it's actually doing well. Um, I'm very pleased with the initial response. It's on Amazon. Look up the cane break zeroing tool. Um, Take a look. More to follow. They'll be coming out with for laser offsets here in the very near future. Cool. Tim Chandler. Um, I'm going to be uh, 
2018 is going to be a busy year. I'm going to be teaching a number of shotgun courses for FPF training, that is Foxtrot pop-up Foxtrot training, um, and with uh, 360 performance shooting, um, bringing some lovely gauge knowledge to the northern Virginia and eastern seaboard area. So come check us out. We'd love to have you. Good stuff. Well, thanks, guys. I I appreciate you uh, dropping by and dropping the knowledge bombs. I look forward to uh, editing these up and distributed them, distributing them because it's it's just good stuff. Good stuff. Um, big thanks to Forge Tactical Training and also Facts on Firearms. They're our sponsors for the podcast. Um, if you're not familiar with Forge, uh, check them out. They're on, a matter of fact, they're, uh, let's see here, Facebook and, and their website and all that. They do a lot of training over in Alliance. Good guys. Matter of fact, uh, Hopefully, we might have a podcast with them in the near future. Also, check out Faxon. Faxon's making some pretty cool stuff. Uh, they branched out into pistol barrels. They are known for rifle barrels, um, especially their lightweight pencil barrels. I'm hearing very good things about them. So normally, I would say you can find us at primaryandsecondary.com, and we have a forum at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. But currently, we have both of them down because I'm changing hosts. Uh, the former, the last host I had was really crappy. And I, kept, I constantly was having issues with it. So I said, screw this. I'm going to spend some money on a quality product. And so hopefully we'll be back up and running just in a couple days. It's going to be nice. And I have some articles just waiting and pending. If you like what you heard, don't hesitate to hit like. Uh, definitely also, if you haven't already, you need to subscribe. You've been watching us long enough. It's time. Um, also, by subscribing, make sure you hit the... Uh, notification button because sometimes we have some surprise modcasts like last night jack and noah and i spoke for we we had a great conversation for about three hours and it was just out of the blue i just started up the channel and we just started talking and it, it was actually really cool um as a matter of fact that is still up and i don't think i'll be taking that one down that's that was just a, a fun conversation um but if, if you like what we have to say uh, don't hesitate to visit patreon.com slash primary and secondary from there, you can help support the entire network. And by helping support the network, that actually pays for, like this, the server migration, uh, all kinds of hosting stuff, all kinds of software, and basically the upkeep and uh, that kind of stuff that we have with primary, primary and secondary. We have like 736 or so uh, Facebook groups, so yeah. Um, if you happen to contribute $5 or more, you will wind up getting access to Let's see here. We have a special Facebook group. We have a ton of discounts to really cool companies. Um, Ike with uh, Big Techs provides some kind of sneak peeks and sneak, not even a sneak. It's just early access to some things. And also there might be some new products that are coming out that uh, we might put aside for our network support people. So check it out, patreon.com slash primary and secondary. We definitely appreciate that support. Big thank you to the to the viewers. Thank you to network support. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do next week. Uh, I've heard a couple possible topics, but we'll see. Probably firearms. And some probably more firearms, firearms and there's some some more firearms and firearms. Tim, did you have something with this? Firearms. Firearms. Yes. Yeah. Firearms. So after this, we'll probably do a little post uh, uh, after show party thingy. And then I'm going to go see the new Star Wars. So, if I have anything else to say, so I, I'll talk to you soon.